Uh, good afternoon or good evening. Yeah, close enough to evening. Uh, this is uh, the budget hearings for the FY 2014 budget, uh, Wednesday, May 29th. Uh, this is the City Council budget hearings, and I'm, my name is Bill Dwight. Um, we're going to start with uh, a roll call. Here. 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 Present. Here. Casey. Here. <laughs> uh, Council Spector, uh, as I said earlier, is, sends his regrets. He does have a conflict uh, presiding over a neighborhood meeting in Ward 2. Um, we do have a quorum, so we're convened. And uh, first up on the agenda, is uh, the is veteran services? This is on page 69 in your hymnals. Um, uh, Steve Connor is here to represent the veteran services for damn near three quarters of the state, but he's here to talk about it. <laughs> and he's just back in from Boston and his whirlwind tour of every Memorial Day parade in 14, 15 towns and counties. I think so. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. Thank you for your presence at the Leeds. Also, that comes from the Leeds Civic Association that could not be present at that one. Thank you. So, Steve, you want to um, you want to give a little synopsis, uh, particularly relevant to the budget and as it's as it's laid out, and then the councilors are invited to ask questions and. If you don't mind, if the questions come up while you're speaking, okay. It's a, <laughs> getting calls? Okay. Emails all day long. Um, sure. As many of you know, um, we have incorporated two additional towns to Central Hampshire Veterans Services. One of those towns was the town of Hadley. And because it's the town of Hadley, rather than having us work under a um, municipal agreement under 40, chapter 40, we had proposed and I went after a grant to move our district under chapter 115, which is the law that um, oversees what we do. We were awarded that grant. With that grant, it allows the two additional towns that have come in to, for all intents and purposes, have like almost a free year of administrative function of their veteran services. There was also additional money put in to anticipate the extra work that was going to happen. So that has all come. And so what FY14 is a transitional year for us, for us to go from the agreement and the contract that will again happen this year, which is a municipal agreement, and hopefully transition to next year to where it'll be a district. And that the importance of that allows less towns having to have individual meetings about what we do. Granted, it'll make my life a little bit easier, um, but it will allow the towns to have a voice in the budget as they now kind of do under the agreement, but this will solidify it and we will operate a little bit more smoothly, but outside of some of the confines that we now operate under. So that was the intention of the grant. We did get the grant, $35,000. So we are moving forward with that, and I'm working with the mayor and the finance director for this transitional year. But um, as far as the benefits and the services that we provide here in Northampton, the, um, nothing should really change other than the changes that normally would happen. Nothing changes but the changes. <laughs> I guess is what I would say. The one thing that I would point out, 
I just stated that I just, or you just stated that I came back from Boston. Um, I've unfortunately had to do a lot of traveling to the Boston area because I am state president of the Mass Veteran Service Officers Association. So it's, it's taken a lot of my time away from the district and it's been difficult for me. So I just kind of run a little ragged. But the benefit from it is a couple of things have happened over this fiscal year as I've been president that have been very beneficial, I think, for our district and especially for Northampton. Primarily one was at places of transitional residence, such as the shelter up at Soldier Island and their transitional housing and the Cherry Street program that the VA runs. Those people that we assist, rather than getting 75% back on whatever we give them, which is our standard, we now get 100% for them. That's a big thing. And the second biggest part of that is if they leave Soldier On or they leave Cherry Street and they go to the REACH program at Brockton or in Bedford, previously they were my responsibility for a year. That's the way the regulations read. And it made it very difficult for us to case manage somebody who's in Bedford. Um, it basically meant we were mailing a check and trying to check in with our caseworkers and make sure things were going as they were supposed to. What's with this 100% coming back to us, also, there is no reason for those other towns to say, well, you're on in Northampton, so you have to be with them for a year before we take over. That has ended. So the directive that came from DVS said, not only is there going to be 100% coming back, but once they leave, leave your community to go to another program, that new community picks them up. And that's been very beneficial for Northampton because we do have a lot of transitional residents come through. Um, so that happened under my presidency that I had been working long and hard for. And the other thing that had changed was we, um, the state has been working with the VA to end homelessness amongst veterans because pretty much the idea is if you served your country whenever however you took an oath you said you were going to fight to protect the constitution and you would die for it so the last thing we should have is somebody who's done that be homeless the secretary of the VA secretary Chinseki had come up with a plan, five-year plan, to end veterans' homelessness and prevent it. It's a grand idea. It's a grand mission. They have come up with a lot of different ways that they're going to do it. The state decided that they also were going to come up with their own plan for Massachusetts veterans. I served on that steering committee under the lieutenant governor and the governor, namely the lieutenant governor's leadership, to come up with a plan. We did it. We announced it in March. Now is the implementation of it. So nothing like the details. <laughs> and so I'm working on with the state and with the networks. I've already been working for many years with um, Pam and with the Western Mass Network. Now I really have to work with them and with other people around the state to make this happen. Um, but one of the other things that happened was we get a lot of people who have been homeless, so they're in a shelter, they're in a transitional residence. They want to go someplace. Well, obviously, they don't have much. So if they get an apartment, the landlords want first, last, and security deposits. That's all fair. It's understandable. They are Section 8 vouchers. so their first and last months is a percentage of the full rent. Not the full rent, but their security deposit is the full security deposit. So you've got somebody who's been chronically homeless for a really long time, and you say, all right, we got this apartment for you. Give me uh, $1,400 and you're in. Here's the keys. And they go, yeah, okay. <laughs> so for many years, we've been assisting those people because they became Northampton residents. We've been helping them out. 
The other thing that's happened this past year is that even in those cases, now the state is reimbursing the city of Northampton 100% of those cases so that rather than getting 75%, we now get 100% back. So that will look good in a year from now or less than a year from now as, as we start getting our reimbursements back. So rather than it's always 75%, now it's 100% for many of our case, for some of our cases. So that that is something that should look good in the next four quarters as we've gone through the last four quarters and the money that we've spent. And we have, in Western Mass, probably, I shouldn't say this without the stats in front of me, but we've probably housed more homeless people um, through this program over the last year than most any other city in Western Mass. So, um, and we do it the right way. So that's, what, um, that's what's happened significantly going forward um, with an incoming budget. There's actually a decrease in some of um, the administrative costs. That's because we've got new towns that have come in and the grant is going to help them with their first transitional year it's good because one of the towns paid fifteen hundred dollars a year and now there's a big jump in that for them so this eases them in the other one paid 150 dollars a year in the budget and now there's money has gone up but we have worked it out and this grant is making it an easier transition for those communities so uh Councilor, any idea how much the Reimbursement now that we'll be getting 100%, how much that'll be saving us? I and don't have the numbers. I can try to gather them for you as we finish up this last quarter of the year, and I can look back and say, how many people did we house, and how many of them now are under the 100% versus the 75%? If, if at some point you can get yeah. some sort of idea, yeah. that'll be helpful just because I. You know, throughout the years, we've we've been hearing how we have to lay out X amount of money and we only get 75% back, and it's it's nice to know that we're finally getting all of it as we should be. So if if we could get some some numbers at some point, that'll be greatly appreciated. Yeah, thank we, you. I can work with my staff, and we'll get the numbers of actually the amount of people that we have and what it costs us. Sure. Councilor Tayson and Councilor Labarge. Yeah, I want to thank you first off. We've talked about this for years. The advo your advocacy and there, anybody else that advocated with you for the 100 percent rather than something thank you very much for that and um i just have a question that it says the grant total here is thirty five thousand dollars Correct. it's given to assist hadley and middlefield and it i really tried to figure out how that was into our budget here in in black and white and i really couldn't figure it out okay it pretty much what has happened is is as we go from fiscal year to fiscal year all the towns look at my full budget and then they divide it up according to population what this grant has done is allowed those two towns to which is just enter hadley in and middlefield right hadley and middlefield are now going to be in our district the money that they would have paid is now going to get paid by the grant but having two additional towns has lowered our administrative costs to the city of Northampton, the town of Had Amherst, the town of Williamsburg. In other words, their um, portion of what they're paying has gone down. Not greatly, but it has gone down. So the addition of the grant shows that, but it also shows in the big scheme of things, the big numbers that I came up with, we had to come up with some additional hours to operate with additional towns. So this year, uh, this second part of this year, uh, second part, excuse me, the last third of this fiscal year and the next two thirds of the upcoming, that grant is going to pay for Hadley and Middlefield's contribution. It's going to pay for some extra uh, staff so I'm going to increase a position by 10 hours. I, I'm, not going to, I'm creating a position of 10 hours yeah. to assist with our administrative stuff. And 
um, there is some equipment that we can now purchase with this grant that's going to allow us to operate. And there's travel money that came with this because I now have to pay, or there's now costs for driving to Middlefield or you know from Cummington or you know, going to Hadley on days that I'm not driving through there anyway. So. That's where that is. I don't know so, if that answers. No, it, it, it does. It really helps. Now, the position, is that you're going to offer more hours to somebody that's already in-house, or, you, or no, you're going I to have to come up with a new position because Rebecca's already at the max. She is already at the max, and I need somebody to help with the administrative tasks of putting in checks because every single city and town still has to come up with their own amount of benefits paid out. It doesn't come from a central place. So Williamsburg still writes a check that benefits that veteran in Williamsburg. Okay, is that is that this ten hour position right here? Yes. That's that's what it is. Okay, and also um, I would also be interested in what Councilor Adams asked you for, the savings right. from the city. I, yeah, I can I can gather it. It used to be a lot easier before it went to this provider that Boston has hired to do yeah. the because we're now through the virtual gateway. So I can't access it easily, but I still, I will talk with the director of operations and see how I can get that. And if I can't get it easily, then we'll just go through all the folders over the you last year. get it year. within a few percent would be right. very good. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Council Lavarge, you had a question? Um, I, I did have my hands up yep. earlier. My question is, he's already answered what I wanted to ask, so thank you, Steve. So you all set? Yep. Okay. So anyone else who has any questions or thoughts or comments? You, you, yeah, I just, <coughs> Council Schwartz. I just want to say I, I do have the pleasure of working with Steve uh, as in my other hat as part of the Western Mass Network to End Homelessness, and we are so fortunate to have him in this position. Um, mm -hmm. So I just want to thank you. Thank you, and, and I went to our state meeting about the next two and a half years because our three-year plan became two and a half years, and we all have to form working committees, just like we did with the Western Mass Network. The veterans um, plan also went, calls for that, and they were going over one group has already come up with their working group, and I heard your name on it, and I went, yay, Western Mass. So, so it was very good to, to hear that you're you're going to be part um, and contributing to it because it's 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 a statewide plan and it's going to take a lot of work, um, but just having people recognize out here out west that we've come a long way. I've as part of that committee, I've said, oh, we've done this and we've done that. They're like, really? And I'm like, yeah. See, we do things out in the west. We're not just a bunch of hicks. We know what we're doing. Where we are. Yeah. But Councilor Freeman Daniels and Councilor Adams and then Councilor Tacey. Uh, thank you. Um, I know this is going to sound like a rather flat-footed question, but um, when does Northampton, will Northampton this year or next year start to see the, some of the other benefits of regionalization? I mean, does it benefit Northampton to continue to expand this network or? At this point in time, you're going to see a decrease it's not significant, but you're going to see a decrease in the administrative costs coming. Um, do I think it's kind of stabilized? Yes, because now anytime I bring on additional towns, if we even go there, I have to get more staff and more equipment. So in, in a sense, um, keeping in this is going to be good in the sense that the administrative cost is shared amongst 10 towns rather than just what we do. But yes, there is a different additional staffing. So I think it benefits the city to do this. Um, but, you know, if I look at what, if we were on our own, what would happen? Things would be going up because we've gotten additional people. Again, when I started, we were assisting 12 people. We now, on a six-month period, are well over 250 um, or 170-something a month that we assist. So that's the city. That's not, you know, the whole district. So getting other towns to 
support the staffing that we need I think has benefited Northampton and not um, um, cost us Thank you. I guess Councilor Adams then Councilor Tacey you're all set Councilor Tacey yeah it's always hard to figure and muddle through uh, sometimes state money and federal money and veteran services is that is that state money or is that federal Veteran Services this? Chapter 115 is local money. It's local money. It, it's what we take out of the Treasury. Right. I then proceed to, or I, I then go through the process of telling the state, look, the law says that I can give these people this money because of this reason. It's in the regulations. So I have done that. I proved that to you. Please authorize that I'm going to get 75% of it back. Most of the time they authorize it. Sometimes they'll say, wait, we don't have this document. You didn't prove this to us. And we then scatter and go, okay, we didn't get that document. And we then have to get that. And it's hard sometimes because we're dealing with emergencies. We have situations where somebody walks into my office on a Friday afternoon and says, I'm homeless. I have nowhere to go. And it's, you know, 14 degrees outside. I have to make decisions, I have to try to do stuff, and then gather everything that I need after the fact. But so far, we've been successful, even though it gave me gray hair. Or maybe I already had it, I don't know. But your requisition is to the state. Right, I send it to the state. The federal government has nothing to do with the program with that I run, Absolutely. Right. as far as the benefits I give out. Do you have any idea where the state comes up with that funding? Is it from the local, is it from taxes? State taxes, within? yes. And nothing to do with the federal, the feds don't, they don't have any part of that. The Why would you suppose that is? The federal comes in is if I have somebody that I've got on and I think they're eligible for federal benefits, then we go after that. So that if they get federal benefits, the state benefits stop. And in some cases, we get money back. That's another point where you can get 100% back. And have we seen that? Oh, yeah. Okay. And is there an end game to this? To the what, chapter 115 money for, for somebody collecting or not? Is there an end game? Yeah. It all depends. If they are retired or disabled, forever. The end game is fine, which is fine. Right. I'm, just, I'm just curious. Those who are unemployed or waiting for disability from the VA, it's, it's the work that we do. Or if they find other work, we just got two people who just went on jobs. So, yeah, we have. We have people who end because they find work and we go yay and hopefully they keep that work and but it's not been a good economy so okay thank hopefully you it's improving Councilor Carmen. Thanks. Um, excuse me Steve do you have a sense an approximate I know you probably don't have these numbers about just generationally I know from the ceremony the other day I would imagine the World War II era vets are um, you know passing I mean, on yes um, what percentage of your the folks you serve are Vietnam era as opposed to the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq or spo you know, uh, spouses of deceased veterans? Just okay. approximate. The way, I'm yeah, and, and, spot here. and I, I'm trying to think, you know, when I started less, you know, over nine years ago when I started, most of the people that we were taking on were either Vietnam veterans or that retired veteran, and many times it was the surviving spouse of World War II veterans. Um, what a hardy breed, both the veteran and their spouses who, you know, well into their 90s. There has been a slow transition of that. We, we would think, wow, if somebody's a returning veteran, if we get one of them in the office, that was like, wow, you know, jeez you know, 2004, 2005, that was something. Um, now, I would say that's somewhere between a quarter and a third of our population that we're helping. Um, because they came home and they couldn't find jobs. So, um, and a lot of our elders have passed on. Now, we still get more and more people. We continue to do the outreach. Um, but I think we've stabilized. I don't think there's many people in Northampton who don't know about veteran services. Unless you're talking about those returning veterans. They don't know. 
And usually I see them when it's crisis and when things have gone bad. So, um, but those numbers have gone up. As far as our retirees and especially our surviving spouses, their numbers used to be a big portion of it. It's gone down. I would say they're less than half of what we, but we also have a lot of veterans who are in disability. Um, and they are the Vietnam vets and those right after. So, so it, it's, 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 I don't have acts. I can probably give you some kind of numbers with the other numbers, but as far as those who are surviving spouses and those World War II and Korean War vets are going down and the other ones are coming up and actually statewide, there's a projection that unless we reinstitute the draft or get into another big war where we really have to go after more people, the numbers are going to drop. So in 15 years, right now we have 360,000 veterans in the state of Massachusetts. In 15 years, they believe that's going to be 170. So that's almost, that's more than half. But also for right now, in terms of your providing assistance to the unemployed and, and homeless, I know you work a lot with Pamela, but um, are you working, I think you coordinate your unemployment, unemployed vet services with the One Stop Career Center? Oh, yes. Yeah, we actually have, um, at this point, it's every other month, but we sit in on a committee with them and we say, all right, what jobs are out there? What veterans do you have? How can we match them up? Okay. And we do it on sometimes on a case-to-case -case basis. So, Thank you, Steve. Uh, uh, oh, Councilor Freeman Daniels? Sorry, I was just curious if those projections included a Republican presidents. <laughs> <laughs> A dig. Yeah. I, I actually, I, I think it's worth noting that um, relative to Councilor Tacey's line of questioning on the uh, state commitment, the, the Massachusetts actually distinguished itself from a number of other states in the union with some of the more progressive uh, compensation for uh, for veterans. Uh, who, and uh, it's actually best in the country, hands down. I'll take that. Okay. And that, yeah. that's something to brag about. And I, I think it's worth noting it in, in its separate. It's a separate commitment by, a, by the Commonwealth, separate from the VA's commitment right. as well, which right. comes up lacking as we, we bumped into, as we, we all recognize now. Right, and as, they, as they've been trying to catch up, because, you know, the, the war was supposed to be a few weeks, and we'd be right. it was and it didn't hour. happen that right. way. Right. So the VA has, oh, they had a million caseload backlog that is trying to get fixed, and they are, doing as best as they can, and I've talked with the manager of the Boston um, facility to catch up on these claims, and they've hired people, they worked on no one of the guys that they hired is an Iraq war vet. Uh, he's a really good guy, but you know he has to be trained, so they're catching up on it. But we're still that, we're that piece that gets them from point A to point B, because if they lived in another state, there's nothing for them while they're waiting for that claim. And right now they're talking about 315 days from start to finish. What is somebody supposed to live on? That's why Massachusetts stands above everyone else. And as a matter of fact, the secretary, Coleman Nee, was down in DC and all these other regional um, county VSOs, things like that, they were like, really, you guys do that? You, you do this, you do that? You're like, yeah. We do. So we are, as it's been known, and because of the returning veterans, Massachusetts is really standing out. Um, so it's kudos well, for the whole state. Grateful for your leadership and in in your role in that. And also, uh, um, I think we understand that you're in the middle of a shakeout period right now as, you're, as, as you uh, establish the aggregate district pool that's going to contribute to lowering of costs. It's going to increase your needs for more administrative systems, but it will, will all the communities will share the burden, but at the same time, the uh, better tracking of, of veterans who need. So really appreciate your time uh, with us today. And uh, uh, consultation. Well, uh, <clears throat> I look at the 10 hours. Is that enough? I don't know. Okay. I'm hoping um, it's the state. Um, I know we've got to let you go. DBS, yeah, yeah, no, DBS but. gave a guide for creating a district. And under that guide, 
it requires that I have at least that. So I'm trying to save all the town's money by at least getting the minimum that I need and going forward. Um, we're going to have some changes in my staff anyways in the coming year because one's going to school full time, another one is retiring, and I'm going to have other people come in and having to train them. But um, I think, you know, I'm hoping that the 10 hours is what we need. If it's not, then I'm we'll going to back to every groups. town yep. and say, look, we're going to need more. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everybody. Next up, uh, City Clerk's Office and the Registrar uh, on page 42 in your budget for those of you reading along at home. Mm -hmm. Wendy, hello. Hello, how are you? Reasonable. How about yourself? Wonderful. Thank you for coming. Thank you um, do you want to give a narrative first? Sure. Or, and Absolutely. are you comfortable um, with the uh, council asking questions? Well, as you know, the, the City Clerk's Office um, is maintains and provides access to all vital documents in the city. Um, as well as to provide service to the public um, and city boards and committees. Um, we have duties and responsibilities governed by the city charter and ordinances and under the jurisdiction of the state um, secretary of the Commonwealth elections. We administer all oaths to all elected and appointed members of the committees and boards and provide access to public records in compliance with the state public records department. Some of the highlights for 2013, um, naturally we had uh, very busy election year um, in 2012. We had a state primary, we had a, a state um, uh, election, um, presidential election, and uh, we held a simultaneous <clears throat> municipal election at the same time. Um, we are also in the process of implementing um, for the election um, the new charter regulations that we're required to do with the election process. Um, and we are um, now responsible for posting all the meetings to the city's website. Um, and <clears throat> that's a daunting task, but we're keeping up with it. And uh, we uh, are certainly ho hoping that, um, you know, we can uh, handle it, continue to handle it with the staff that I have. Um, the, registers, the registrar's office mailed out 14,132 census um, and, uh, last year, and we approximately sent out 3,681 confirmation cards. And the confirmation cards are people that did not answer the census. Um, so we have to follow up with a confirmation card. We're required by law to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's just another added um, job uh, when it comes time for census. Um, having said that, our, my budget is pretty much bare bones. Um, you know, we're, we're <clears throat> operating on a, uh, a bare bones budget. Um, the biggest driver in my budget is the elections, um, naturally, and, and the um, ordinances um, as the council passes ordinances um, the code company updates them on the city's website and that becomes expensive um, and it continues to be expensive so um, the city has had to put um, money into my budget to uh, make sure that it's covered uh, the bills are covered for that um, the elections the same way the city will have to make my budget whole at the end of this this fiscal year for for the elections because we're having another special election with the state <clears throat> election, uh, state prime, state election, special state election. And so that's going to require additional people working at the polls. Um, and, you know, a payroll, uh, you know, ultimately, even if I don't have additional people, is about $13,000 for election workers because you have to have two shifts of people that are coming in, a shift in the morning, a shift in the afternoon. Um, having said that, I mean, we're... I'm, try, we're, I'm trying to meet the, the city's um, <clears throat> mandate to cross-train. I am cross-training um, as we speak um, for election, and um, <clears throat> I have a new clerk in the registrar's office, so I can't quite cross-train her too much because she needs to learn her job on that side, but um, it's working out well, um, and it is a big help uh, when, they're not, uh, when they're slow in the registrar's office to come over and help us on the clerk side. Um, other than that, I mean, it's, you know, the census this year was an expense, the, the city census is always an expensive proposition. Um, postage for that is paid out of the central services department, and that's like $5,100 to mail the census out. Um, and the cost to the vendor f out of my budget is about $4,000 um, for the census to go out. And that's about 14,900 pieces uh, of, of census that go out to a household. They go by household, not individually. 
So I mean, it's it's pretty it's it's pretty bare bones. Uh, Council of Barge. <clears throat> Wendy, you just mentioned about cross training. Mm -hmm. When did you start doing that? Um, we I actually started um, in uh, February of this year. Um, during our licensing period uh, because I was short staffed in the registrar side, but we were so busy on the clerk side. So <clears throat> I took one of the, uh, the, the only staff member on the registrar side to train her to help us with licenses on our side. And it worked out very well. Who was the staff? It was Mary Ellen. And she did what? How, what did you train her on? Uh, actually, the dog licenses. We do about, we're up to almost 19, 1,900 dog licenses. So we, with two people trying to do that and handle other work in the office, I needed to have a third person to do that. The position that was taken away <clears throat> mm -hmm. last year, mm -hmm. how has that left your office? Are you manageable now with the, the amount of staff that you have? I, we're we're surviving i won't say that we're manageable i mean you know when you lose a position someone has to pick the work up and um at this point um i as the department head am out there picking that work up as well um so i mean right now it's hard to have somebody come over and train in those aspects of my job on the work side because of the election. They're very busy now trying to make sure that everybody's registered to vote. People are coming in and voting absentee. You know, today we were very busy with people voting absentee. So some of that will, will get pushed off till after this election, and then we will certainly go back to trying to train them on certain pieces of it. But you will always miss a position, always, no matter what. Okay. On the special elections, mm -hmm. I have great concerns because every time I came into your office, you apparently were not eating lunch. You, you don't have a lunch time. No. You give it to your staff, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. You were spending every evening, mm -hmm. every weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sundays mm -hmm. at City Hall. That's correct. Okay for almost two weeks, mm -hmm. almost two weeks. That's correct. If you had not done that, would that election been successful no. by your staff? No. Why? Because there would have been something that would have fallen through the cracks. There would have been something that was missed during the election. Someone would have gotten missed on the, the voter rolls. There would have been something that was not uh, sent to the polls um, as far as supplies go. I mean, all of it is a process and you have to follow this process. And if you can't do it during your normal work hours, I mean, you have to understand that I just don't do elections. I have an entire another job to do as city clerk. And that takes a good 80% of my time. I mean, with vital records and people calling and coming in. That's the crux of my job. The elections are, are secondary to my job. So when an election happens, all of this over here as clerk has to stop because I have to focus on the election. So all I, those extra hours mm -hmm. that you mm -hmm. put in yep. for those whatever, it mm -hmm. could have been longer, but I do know for a fact for two weeks, mm -hmm. you were at City Hall Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday. That's correct. Two consecutive weeks, mm -hmm. could have been longer. My question is, your software in your department, mm -hmm. has it been upgraded yet? Um, the state is coming in with uh, new computers just before this election. Mm -hmm. Thank you, state. Um, hopefully they're going to be okay and working. Um, I don't have any control over that. <clears throat> it's it's their, They own the computers, so they're coming in, they're replacing all the computers and the printer um, just before this, this special election and um, you know, hopefully it's good. It's go I mean, that system needs some upgrading because it is very slow. Um, on my side, I just got a new computer. So, I mean, for myself, it's, it's wonderful now. I don't have to sit for half an hour and wait for the computer to, to uh, boot up and actually work. I mean, I lost a complete program because the computer crashed. But um, so it's working fine. Um, and my assistant has a new computer, so that's that's fine. We have some hiccups, uh, you know, but it has nothing to do with the city. It's the program that the state has given us because it's an old DOS program, and they, this, the the city is having trouble with it, uh, trying to make to try to keep it up and running. Uh, and they've done they've done it so far, and they've been successful with that. Thank God. Okay, because I think with 
having and getting rid of the old system and mm -hmm. bringing in the new systems, mm -hmm. this would help out your department oh, considerably, oh, considerably, okay? Mm -hmm. And as far as employees and your time and mm -hmm. so forth. Absolutely. Now, we do, a uh, Gail, she's a new employee. That's correct. You had lost two other staff within that period of time, mm -hmm. which made it very difficult for running your office during election times. Mm -hmm training staff right so now you're all set with that you have the city clerk's office mm -hmm. and you have the register mm -hmm. of voters office i'd like to get some clarification mm -hmm. on here okay they're all one office all one, we're all one office yes we are they have separate functions but we're one office you're all one office that's correct okay i'm glad to start hearing that you're yes all we are one office. I'm the department head for both of them, so we are all one office. It's just that the registrars has a, uh, they have a separate function from the clerk's office. They they are mandated by the secretary of the commonwealth. They have a specific calendar that they have to meet, and if those dates and 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 and, and positions that they need to uh, the jobs that they need to do are not met, uh, then the secretary is going to call me up and want to know why. Okay, so. so being all one office, I can see where the cross-training mm -hmm. would take effect, mm -hmm. right? Because if you needed help, say Pam was off or something, mm -hmm. you pull one of the girls off from that other side mm -hmm. on the register of voters and bring them over with That's you. Right. So that makes sense, mm -hmm. correct? Absolutely, absolutely it does. You have to do what you have to do with the limited amount of staff. So. All right, so right now everything is going okay in your office? So far, yes. Ask me that in two weeks just before the election and I'll let you know. <laughs> Okay, now the election workers you had down on here mm -hmm. at 32,372. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Is that what we're going to be running again now for? Can you give me the reasons for that price at 32,372? Well, normally, 32, normally that amount of money is usually for two elections. Okay. Um, and usually that will cover if, if I was having a preliminary, let's say, and an election. That would cover that would cover those both elections but it's been an extraordinary election year so naturally that money didn't cover um you know the the um, the the amount of election workers i had to hire so i was you know i was going to i'm going to probably be in deficit um more than likely i will because i think i probably only have like let's see election workers i have 261 dollars left in that so i will be in deficit after this um um, and your budget is what for the year? Um, it's, uh, what is it, 10,000, no, wait a minute, election workers is 34,000. Well, actually, it's, it was bumped up to 47.1 uh, because of the other elections. But um, I've got $261 left in this budget for this year. Um, but, you know, uh, Peter Kokot is still hoping that he can still get some money out of, out of the state to reimburse the city for the cost of these, these you know, uh, special election so he I talked to him and he he is working on it and you know he's hoping that you know, he, uh, it will move forward uh, on this election coming mm -hmm. in June we have a special election I had told you I had gotten this email from a resident not on Ward 6 I don't even know what ward but I also mm -hmm. let Bill know about it who felt that all of us city councilors that's all we know how to do <clears throat> is spend money because of putting up a special election coming in in June. Can you explain as a city clerk, mm -hmm. okay, what that cost is? And as long as I was born and raised in this city, I've, this is not the first time that I've seen people come in to place something else on a ballot. So what is that extra the, the, cost? The cost is and is that cost there in your budget mm -hmm. just in case now for somebody comes election. So right now with this special election, this is not covered. No, I don't have that money, no. Because it's, it's, an, unforese it's an unforeseen expense. I mean, I had no way of knowing that the, the state was going to plan a special election, nor did I have any way of knowing that the city was going to be holding an override. I mean, nor did the city know that either. No. So, I mean, it's, it's, you know, you are, you know, as I said, the city is going to have to come in and balance my budget at the end 
they'll know how much it is. I mean, the cost on the special election for municipal side is going to be the ballots. There will be an extra cost for the additional election workers that's going to be required. Um, there'll be a cost for the additional voters lists that have to be printed because the law requires two separate voters lists, one for the municipal, one for the state. You can't have, you can't use the same one. Um, and so there will be costs. Um, will it will it be expensive? I don't know. You know, I I mean, I can't tell you that because I don't know what the cost is for the printing of my ballots yet. Um, I just all I have is the absentees. And so no matter when we have an election or not, just a regular election, and then we have something else that comes right. aboard, another um, ballot to be right. placed. Special election is not budgeted for. Correct. I only budget for for whatever is going to be within that fiscal year that I know is going to happen, whether it, I always plan for a preliminary. We may not have a preliminary, so that money will yeah. be there for that preliminary, from that preliminary. And so if something else came up where there was a special election, then that money would be there for that. So then where do we get the money to pay them? You'll have to ask Susan that. You would need to make a transfer from, from reserves. Yeah. Again, we On the prop two and a half. But I'm not asking about the senior center. But you know, in in, in all reality, in all reality, though, the city is saving money by having it on June 25th because the polls are going to be open anyway. You could have spent additional money by waiting and having it afterwards, and then you know, opening the polls up and you know, having me fill you know. 14 precincts again with with workers. I mean, so I mean, you are saving money in that respect. Okay. Uh, Councilor Tacy, you you had your hand up, yeah. and then Councilor Freeman Daniels. And uh, you you work nights and weekends. I know you do, and I know that when I come into your office during the day, if it's lunchtime, you're usually trying to eat something while you're running back and forth between phones and your mm -hmm. computer and mm -hmm. or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And are you compensated for that additional time? I'm elected. No, it's part of my job. So you are. I just want. To be clear, that you're not compensated for anything. Okay, and uh, you know that when you run. Yeah. <laughs> Just wanted to get it out there. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are you also at Councilor Tacy? I'm fine. Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels. Thank you. Um, what can you? Uh, this is not in the budget, mm -hmm. but um, can you give give the council a general estimate as to when new voting machines? Uh, need to be, will need to be uh, purchased I can't, and because the state has not, um, they have not certified any machine. They have not even looked at any machines as yet. Um, I anticipate that it'll be before the next presidential election that we'll have new machines, because they're not they're not the machines we have. Are, they've gotten a waiver, but that waiver is not going to. They're not going to allow the, the feds are not going to allow the, the city to continue to use a machine that doesn't meet the federal guidelines. Um, so I anticipate probably four years we'll be looking at purchasing some new machines, and that'll be a substantial cost. So, but since the state hasn't actually they haven't certified anything, so we're continue to use um, the optic scanners, and really and truly, they're great machines. You know, anybody that when they when they come in to have maintenance. Any person that the maintenance people that come in to maintain these machines say they're crazy to get rid of them because these were one of the best machines, but they don't meet the federal guidelines. And to try to retrofit them, it's just really too much money. So they, they can't, they won't do that. So. Councilor Adams, did you have a question? No, I didn't. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councilor Labarge. Yep. One day I want to thank you, mm -hmm. Pam, Mary Ellen, and your new employee, Gail, mm -hmm. um, for working as tirelessly as all of you do in that office Thank and you. believe me it is very well appreciated from many residents in the city and also on my ward which you've seen me mm -hmm. come in with some of my residents mm -hmm. and I want to thank you, thank you and all your staff. Well, I mean, my staff makes my staff is the one that makes me look good. I mean, they're they're the front line people, so they make me look good. And you know, the 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 thanks go to them. Thank you. Thank you. Did you get my census back? <laughs> yes, after I asked you for it, Counselor. Otherwise, he would have been inactive. Oh, okay? uh oh. So, uh, thank Wendy, you. thank you so much. And, and actually, to Counselor Barge's point, the uh, 
there we have a number of departments that have unanticipated costs well, uh, the uh, plowing snow uh, overtime costs associated costs with um, um, uh, the veterans as well and as you say you can't there's no way you can possibly anticipate uh, uh, a senator at any random point being appointed for the, although many people did anticipate Senator Kerry including Senator Kerry being appointed as Secretary of State but the fact is or when Ted Kennedy died. so the, the fact is is that there will be times that we'll have to appeal to reserves to because democracy has, a, has an associated cost with it as well. Absolutely. And thank you for your administration of those costs, and we appreciate it. And we'll appreciate try to your keep time them down Thanks. as much as we can. Thank you. Uh, speaking of the snow and ice, um, it's it, my goodness, we're actually running out of time at this point. Uh, this is time for the Department of Public Works, uh, page, pages 81 through 89 in your hymnals. Um, Ed, you're on. Come on up. Come on down. Yeah, you get so many pages. Sure. I mean, yeah. yeah. Councilor Tacey wants to know why you got so many pages on the budget. <laughs> and how much do those pages cost? Because I had to read them. <laughs> it costs about 20 million. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for coming, Ned. Uh, I don't know if you want to, uh, what some of the department heads have done, have come and give a kind of a brief overview if you're inclined towards that, if you just want to open up the floor to questions. I was just planning to open up the floor to questions. It's pretty much laid out in your budget manual. Okay. Um, our budgets and uh, our highlights from this past year and what we're intending to go forward in FY14. Um, counselors, you have some questions for <coughs> Mr. Huntley, Councilor Casey. What do we attribute the lower than promised increase in the water and sewer rates this year? What do we attribute that to? Um, the Board of Public Works decided to take money out of uh, free cash accounts to pay for some capital improvements rather than borrowing. Okay. That's okay for now. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Uh, Council Labarge. Um, thank you for being here. No problem. Now, looking at the budget book. I noticed in the year of 2013, you took care of 2.6 miles of bicycle paths. Compared to this budget, you'll be taking care of, you'll be responsible for 10.3 miles of bicycle paths. That is 7.7 .7 miles more added on from last year, correct? That's correct. You also stated that there is over 100 vehicles and other equipment. Do you have an exact amount of equipment? We have an equipment list. I'd be more right, because you're you. saying 100 vehicles and other equipment. Sure, we have like uh, small steamrollers that aren't vehicles, but they're used out in city streets for maintenance of paved areas. Um, there's other items like a uh, FM, FMC uh, uh, hydro seeder that is a piece of equipment that we use to uh, established grass and playing areas, but it's not a vehicle. Okay, I'm just asking what the total amount was. I don't know off the top of my head, but I can give you the list of our city equipment if you'd like. Okay. Um, equipment operators, looking at your budget, is there an increase of staff, Ned? On the general side, no. On the enterprise fund, yes. How many? Um, I believe that we created um, two positions in FY13 to be filled this year. One is a pretreatment coordinator that we hired a person for out of water division to take over the services of a pri private contractor who will be retiring this coming year. And the other one was a proposed operations treatment manager in the water division to assist the superintendent, David Sparks, uh, mainly because we don't have any deputy superintendents anymore. And the increase of workload of uh, regulatory obligations is not going away. And uh, with it, there's more reporting to be done. Okay, also notice that like the vacancies that you have in the highway department, 
Are the, is that being fulfilled now? Yes. I'm These are a snapshot in time when the budget was created. Is not what exists right now. This, so this was done a, a couple <laughs> months ago when we were developing the budgets. So it's what was happening at that time a couple months ago. Oh, okay. So it's not explained to me. So those vacancies are filled. I believe they are all filled at this point. That's correct. Also, um, we know, and I'm pretty sure, keeping up with the landfill cost and so forth, that all the debts associated with the landfill closing is all that is put in place. We're all taken care of with that. We believe it is all set through the financial assurance mechanism that was created. Uh, we're going to be capping the landfill this summer. We set aside uh, about a million and a half dollars for the 30 year post closure care. And with it, all remaining debt service is scheduled to be paid off through the financial assurance mechanism. We have a outstanding debt service that runs to 2017 on the uncapped landfill. And that will be paid out of those funds also. Okay, also the solid waste enterprise fund covers what portion of positions in your department and in the city? If I can recall, there was a list way back with that solid waste enterprise fund coming out of that landfill, which in also included some of the counselors, part of the mayor's pay, quite a bit of employees in your department. So what happens now? Um, there are still some direct indirect costs that are coming out, not as much as was before, mainly because the uh, fund has decreased so much. Right now there is scheduled to be 2.5 full-time employees, then a number of gatekeepers that actually sell permits and watch for blue bags, things like that. And I believe that there's um, about 15 of those, all part-time unbenefited positions. How about the cell tower? Are we still collecting money from that? Absolutely. About how much is that? Uh, this year, I believe it was about $66,000. And we put that right into the enterprise fund? That's correct. Okay. Scrap metal. That was a big one which I talked with Susan about. Mm -hmm. Because when I've gone down to the Glendale landfill, there's piles of scrap metal down there. Now that we are closing that landfill, what happens to the scrap metal? We continue to take it up to WTE and Greenfield to get paid for it. And the 50 percent share goes away with Solid Waste Solutions, who is operating the landfill. That was part of the contractual agreement we had with them. So 100 percent of that money will be coming into us now instead of 50 percent. 100 percent. Yeah. That's good. And then what, where is that going to be placed? In the general fund or? No, that goes back into the enterprise fund. Into the enterprise fund? That's correct. Thank you. You're welcome. Also, too, Ned, I know quickly, if you don't mind, Council President. No, no, go ahead. No, no, finish. That I know I had emailed you because there were some concerns of residents that were going recently into the Glendale Road landfill to bring whatever they had for debris and so forth, like shrubs and stuff like that. I'm very concerned about the process of handling the money, how it's being tracked, how it's being recorded down there. Can you explain to me what your procedure is? He said that when he came in with his pickup truck, that he was told $35, came back again, didn't mind, gave him the $35 in cash. He asked for a receipt, and he said he was not able to get a receipt. Then he came back the second time with less of a load, didn't have to go through the weigh scale or anything like that, and they charged him again the same amount of money, asking for a receipt, and he could not get the receipt, and the money was handed to that person. How is that accounted for? How do you keep track of people handing down cash? How is it tracked? How is it recorded? Okay. Uh, we have bulky waste cards that people can buy. They have a certain value to them. They can use them and get punched out on them as they use up the dollar value of it. We have do have customers that come in with cash to get rid of appliances, TVs, things of that nature. Uh, there's a schedule of fees attached to that. I don't know why someone didn't get a receipt if they asked for it. There is a receipt book there in the gate to attendant shed at the landfill. So it's always available to write out receipts. The gatekeepers do a regular turn-in with Deb Leiser of our staff um, as far as uh, basically selling permits, how many they sold, 
Uh, there's always a turnover going on with that. We eliminated most of the cash that the gate attendants were handling with the blue bag program because they don't sell anything of that nature anymore. So the only thing that's coming in that they'd be collecting any revenues for was a couch that might come in on Saturday, something of that nature. And like I said, receipts are always available. I'm not sure why this person said he couldn't make one or couldn't give one. Right. He had great concerns because a receipt would not be given to him. Uh, there should be no problem with that at all. I'll make sure staff understands that. Thank you. Um, I've already asked. Oh, okay. I've already spoke once. Yes, you have. Councilor Carney and then Councilor Tacey, you still interested okay. in okay. Thanks, so, Ned. I'm just looking at the six year comparison of the solid waste enterprise um, fund. Um, so, and this is also for folks to understand who might be looking at this back home. Um, actually, um, maybe, Susan, I don't know if you can tell me this. Is this, oh, it's actually in a PDF form. Or online, right? For folks to see? Mm -hmm. Okay, so folks would be able to see these. Um, and this is really helpful. Thanks. So the 2009 um, the, uh, Solid Waste Enterprise Fund was at 53, so about 5,400,000 mm -hmm. and projected in 2014, 1,400,000. So that's about 4 million difference. Is it safe to say that that four million difference is entirely due now to the closing of the landfill? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, um, uh, so how do we see ourselves making up that? Because it's uh, right now it looks like there's a lot that's that comes out of. Well, I, I know you have budgeted for your million and four hundred thousand for the positions here, but. Um, is there anything that you would say really more to elaborate around the impact of, of the loss, the $4 million loss to the Department of Public Works? Um, <clears throat> we didn't have staff running the landfill on a daily day basis. We had a contractor doing that work. Contract services was about $500,000 a year to run the landfill. So that's gone. Um, as far as uh, revenues, the actual Budget going forward is about six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. It shows the one point four million because there's a transfer to come, go in to take care of this year's expenditures out of the undesigned fund balance. So <coughs> clearly our budget is in the six hundred and fifty thousand dollar range going forward. Just so you're aware of that, um, our concerns are that uh, the enterprise fund is going to remain uh, financially solvent. Uh, right now, we our best guess our best guess estimate is that we'll be making a profit at the end of the year or excess revenues of about $20,000, which is not a great cushion that we uh, are used to having. Okay. Um, th th that's all I'm looking at. How much did you say the cushion was? 20. About 20000 Okay. Um, in the storm drain, uh, $410,000 in some change. Should there be the Stormwater Enterprise Fund established, will this free up this $410,000 into your day-to-day -day operation at the DPW? Yes. It will? Yes. And I imagine you've got places that you'd like to use that. Absolutely. And I, I, I have gotten receipts from uh, the landfill at, for cash mm -hmm. uh, at certain times for different jobs I've done for, and I've actually asked for receipts. I've gotten them, um, but it's always during the week. I don't, not on the weekend or anything. So anyway, thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Murphy. Mm -hmm. um, not, not directly to the budget, but just things that constituents ask me about all the time. Um, where, where's North Street? That, that's an FY13 street, right? Um, so. The work will continue, we estimate, till August or September this year. Yeah. But that was budgeted in 13? It was. Yeah. What, what do we got f on tap for 14 for streets? Um, currently, under pavement management, uh, we just sent in the Chapter 90 request to pave uh, Main Street and North Main Street in Florence, from South Main Street up to Clementines, which is the end of our mm -hmm. city layout. 
We're going to be doing a rubberized crack <coughs> ceiling on Kennedy Road, and we're in the process of evaluating the net for next year's streets, other streets with rubberized chip seal, predominantly some of the country roads like Sylvester, Chesterfield, Reservoir Roads. Hello. So we, we get, so we're looking at basically a street a year? Um, we Along get, right currently, we get just a hair over a million dollars a year from Chapter 90 funds. Mm -hmm. Majority of it is being spent in the pavement management. Some of it goes to consulting fees to do small design projects and look at different various traffic elements in the city. Mm -hmm. And also, um, and this year's proposed budget is half of one of our engineers, our traffic engineers, funded through Chapter 90 funds for about mm -hmm. $25,000 a year. Mm -hmm. What would it take? I mean, because we've talked about the fact that I know there's streets in everybody's ward that have been on the books forever. What? What would it take to get our road surfaces where you want them, financially speaking? About $38 million. About $38 million? That's our, that's our paving backlog. Obviously, we wouldn't pay the whole city in one the, year. At the same time, no. You. Well, I think a generous plan would be probably in the 4 to $5 million a year range to catch up. 4 or $5 million a year every year till you hit $32 million. Well, it was 38. 38? Um, it would... Uh, 32 would make a dent, though, I imagine. It would make a big dent. You're absolutely <laughs> right. So what we've done in the past five years is we've caught up with all the crack ceiling in the city. We went from a $100,000 a year contract, maintenance contract, down to this year is $22,000. So we've made progress on doing maintenance of the streets to keep them from going into ill repair. Um, the back side of it is that we've increased our pothole, or our asphalt budget, from $25,000 to $100,000 a year because of the lack of ability to keep up with the paving that's required mm -hmm. in the city. Mm -hmm. But I know, I mean, the way you grade a road, the, some of our streets are to the point where it's almost silly to patch them anymore. I mean, even on Kennedy Road, your guys are going to have to go in the woods to find the asphalt to glue down with the, you know, with the crack sealer. There, there are some streets that are in <laughs> yeah. dire straits. But I, I just, the reason is my constituents are all already asking me. So it's $38 million and your, your budget is what? less than a million. No, not so, but your overall departmental budget. Oh, my old overall budget is about twenty million, including well, all the enterprise funds. So, in other words, more money than we spend every year on your whole department would be necessary to get people's streets where they all want to see them. That, that would be correct. So that's why it takes a while. Yes. Thank you. And that is in the context of uh, law of diminishing returns from the state's obligations to help subsidize road maintenance and repair. I know it's a trend. <laughs> People are getting tired of me bitching about the state's right. obligations. There, well. there, there is a big push right now to increase the chapter yeah. nine funds to the city by about five hundred thousand dollars a year, to uh, one point five million. Though I haven't seen that obligation yet. I understand it's been currently debated. Uh, Council of Barge and then Council Tacy. Ned, is there a list where people can get on the website to see like when the streets are going to be done? There is not. There is a list, I believe, on our website that shows the benefit value, the street segment, and the cost to repair. I believe that was posted about a year ago. I can verify and check that if you'd like. Okay, because I told you I have residents on Sylvester Road. Mm -hmm. I want to have a meeting with yep. you and I and the counselor from Ward 7 in regards to the conditions of Sylvester Road. Mm -hmm. So I was just curious. So we also, when we look at pavement management, um, which we do have a program for, we've been running it for close to 11 years or so, um, it does weigh heavily on benefit value, which is the volume of traffic associated with it. So what we're trying to do now is look at with our budget is, there's various ways streets go into disrepair. The first one is just maintenance of crack ceiling, then potholes, and then we look at uh, mill and overlays, which is scarifying or taking off a couple inches of pavement, then repaving that. And those are the ones we're trying to catch now before they go into what we call a reclaim, which is extremely costly, and it's about a million dollars a mile to do that. So what we're trying to do is catch these streets before they fall off that number, that index. And this is one of the reasons we looked at Main Street, Florence, and North Main Street in Florence also uh, this year, because they had a PCI or pavement con condition index of 61, and 60 is kind of the drop off. So in another year or two, we'd be looking at doubling the cost of doing that work on the, those streets. Okay. Also, too, I want to thank you and all your employees at the Board of Public Works for doing what you're doing to helpfully 
make our streets as safe as they can be. And I know when I call, it might be a pain, but I get many calls about potholes and what the roads are actually looking like, which they are becoming deplorable. But I want to thank you. When I do call, they do come out and they do patch them and make it safe and they're making it safe for the children. Like on Rural Lane, the potholes were huge and the children had to wait for a bus there. And it is well appreciated for everything that all your staff do and you. And I'm hoping that we look at this landfill very, very carefully because there are ways that we can bring back money. And I know we can, so I'm hoping that as the council on the ward and the mayor being involved and our council president and the Board of Public Works, we look at the direction that we're going into because I think if we just sit back and just let it ride, that's not going to help us with getting somebody in there to run that area out there to do something. Mm -hmm. And there are ways that we can make money. Right. Our biggest focus has been actually working on getting the landfill closed. And after that, I realized that the board is going to make some decisions as to what to go forth with some of the properties we own and what might happen out there in the future. Okay. Um, Councilor Tacey, Councilor Freeman Daniels just had his hand up. You mind? Once more? Had a, okay. Already had a so <laughs> Councilor Freeman Daniels and Councilor Tacey. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Director Huntley. I, um, I just wanted to review the highways uh, budget. And uh, I, I noticed that uh, you'd allocated uh, $10,000 to streets and sidewalks. Um, I would imagine that's more sidewalks than streets. I mean, what? That's what typically was for sidewalk repair. Okay. Is that, I mean, is that sufficient for what, for the t volume of work orders that, that usually come in and the calls that no, were related to? Oh, And neither is the staffing. We don't have enough staff to do what we need to do in the city, especially in the the the, or the, um, the general side, which is parks, cemetery, storm drains, um, highway division, name a few. So this number, I mean, this is a really a constrained number. Then. I think it's been set for probably at least seven or eight years. And, seven, seven, eight years. and it's it's really just the most remedial kind of work that you can that you can do. Um, is that number ever broken I mean do you ever borrow from other places to if you ever go over if we that, go over yeah. we do borrow from other accounts in the highway division mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I also just I, I had a couple other questions um, staying in the highway um, the highway division spends uh, a little over three thousand dollars on um, like it looks maybe like ma maintaining the tree belt uh, loams grass seed pesticides herbicides and then the recreation side spends about uh, nine mm -hmm. on the same line items, and I didn't I didn't think there was maybe one more in the sewer side. No, there wasn't. So, um, what the? That's just twelve thousand dollars for right. basically, unless I'm missing a line item. That's is that like basically twelve thousand for all of the non sit non school, non rec department. Green rec, space? Well, the rec department or the parks and, parks and cemetery are one division, but they're broken apart budget separately. So in parks, those are for overseeding, things of that nature, some of the playing fields each year to keep them going, versus on the highway side, it's usually due to plow damage from the winter, and that's why we have a loam and seeding item. So we go out and do repairs to the edges of the road as citizens request as we damage their lawns during the winter. Okay, so then, so that's not the tree belt type stuff that... Uh uh, it could be in the tree belt. Um, is, are you referring about planting trees also? No, that's a different line item, I think, right, isn't it? It is. It's a small line item with yeah, the- $5,000. Right. And the Solid Waste Enterprise Fund had a contribution each year of a $10,000 into a green fund, we call it, for trees and uh, planting in the city and the woods for Arbor Day, things like that. So, so each, I mean, the. Your different departments don't do you, you just budget them differently just this it's the same crew that does the work is that right no oh really no uh, parks and cemetery have their own dedicated staff and they get help in the summer with the seasonal program and highway division runs its own program with its own staff also okay um i saw 
half a million dollars for sludge disposal. That's from the sewer enterprise. That's correct. Is that going to go up? Um, <clears throat> it's actually remained steady for the past few years. It's going to go up as diminishing regional landfill capacity goes away. Currently, it's being hauled up to Maine, state of Maine. Before that, was going up to Moortown, Vermont. So we're getting hit with some good uh, transportation expenses too. So that's included in that half million. That's correct. So you think that's that could go up as the region? We'll be putting that out to bid next year again. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many how many trips is that? Uh, basically, it's a trip almost every day except for weekends. Really? Leaving the plant. We used to take it to our own landfill until 2001 when the state put a ban on it, and then we had to start uh, bringing it to other facilities. Uh, and last question about the water department. I see $200,000 planning on being purchased for land. Mm -hmm. um, do you have particular sites in mind, or is that yes, just we do. Okay. Yeah. That's the where that $200,000? Some are currently going through executive session with the Board of Public Works. Uh, some of them are in queue for purchasing, and we're also seeking 50% state grants this year again. Last year, the state had no grant program. I think you probably recall the Skibiski parcel. We received a little over $300,000 from the state. So we'll be trying to go through the and uh, competing with other communities for the same pool of money again. I know that I didn't give you a lot of notice, but do you have any, do you have any figures for how much state and federal grant funds your, uh, the entire Public Works Department used in the last year? I don't know off the top of my head, though I do have a running <laughs> spreadsheet of the grants that we've seen this past year. Um, I know one off the top of my head was um, a series of miscellaneous solid waste grants that we get that range anywhere from uh, technical assistance from DEP to thousands of dollars to buy recycling bins, things of that nature. We had a um, a water conservation program grant this year from DEP that replaced all the city toilets and urinals with low flow fixtures. That was about a $62,000 grant. Uh, we do have pending grants in front of FEMA totaling over $3 million for the Upper Roberts Meadow Reservoir Dam, uh, the erosion control at Mil Mil Roberts, Roberts Meadow Brook, excuse me, and then the River Road Retaining Wall. Uh, we have applications in for those that hopefully we'll be hearing soon from them. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Tacey. Uh, in your uh, six-year comparison to highways, the other than ordinary maintenance, is it just a coincidence that the numbers are identical this year? From 104,147 from fiscal year 13 to 14. It's a level funded budget. Just so that's just Yeah. Okay. And can you go touch chapter 90 again a little bit? What's the $500,000 additional planning you spoke of? In the transportation bond bill, if it gets approved, there's a new allocation of chapter 90 funds they're trying to increase everyone by 50%. I don't know where it's going to go. It's in debate right now, but I know Northamptonshire could use it. So it's a matter of, um, like I said, it's, it's in debate, and I don't know what the end result's going to be coming out of that. Okay. And uh, one more question. I want to say you reserve the right, or, or you have discretion. You can move money around within a, one of your departments here and there for different line items. If you, if you don't utilize this funding for what is outlined here, can you move that money with, to a different line item within your department? If you don't use $10,000 for sidewalks, can you, if you use 8000 can you put 2000 somewhere else that you might need it at? If it stays within the highway division budget, okay. that particular division budget, we don't go across divisions. They have their own budgets to stay within. I know you can't do water and sewer and enterprise funds, but, but within your own But you can do a financial division. transfer through the city council to yep. switch funds around. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I know that uh, there was some scuttle about about uh, making municipal bonds taxable instruments or something about that that might, might have an impact on investment in municipal bonds on the state side. Just just to put a cold chill in your heart, if you want to say that. 
it's a federal initiative, but it would have it would have a direct impact on our ability to actually subsidize a lot of these things that we we are called upon more and more to subsidize when federal and, and state governments abdicate their responsibility. You don't need to answer that. It's just my little preaching from the pulpit. Uh, I, Councilor Freeman Daniels, no, no? I was just I was just going to say I don't think that uh, Director Huntley needs to weigh in on the on no the differences. You don't of need to weigh in on federalism just, there. You know, just to make everyone feel less comfortable about the circumstances, but it's indicative of a trend, and the trend that we're discussing through the whole discussion of this is as more and more uh, as upper as further upstream in the federal and state governments as they they meet their obligations less and less and more through grants than less through actual funding mechanisms. It falls upon the communities to, uh, you know, you're talking about a very elaborate program of essentially band-aids. Uh, Band-Aids to circumvent catastrophic failure. One point, in fact, actually, we should be working and developing and sustaining a robust infrastructure. But the fact is, is you're just trying to keep your nose above the waterline, and so, and that's that informs every conversation that we have on in, in this level. And I just want to continue to remind people that we're the last stop. Or the sewage treatment plant, if you will, in a metaphor, of uh, being down, down flow, and there's a responsibility that ultimately falls upon us, and, and we, consequently, bear the cost. I'd rather lower on the food chain. <laughs> I don't think you can get much lower. <laughs> uh, any other questions for uh, Director Huntley? Uh, for Director Huntley, I know this was. I I did send you that notice about last week, but if possible, can we? Is it possible to get? last year's grants and the one and some of the ones that you're looking at for this year sure um, you know next month or, or something like that Can I just add one thing counselor all of the city grants have, are compiled in the audit that's done uh, so every grant to every department is, is also okay. compiled there all in one place so for the for the last fiscal year yes yeah, so we can the, also um, the Scanlon audit that we have so we can also point you to that as well do you want that from Myself, or do you want the overall? If it's, type if it's in the audit, then it's fine. already been compiled and done as part of our audit. So it's rather than having them have to recreate, you can you can cross that off your list. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Ned, thank you for your time. Really thank you for it. your time tonight too. Next up, I believe Anne Marie. I think yes. Right on time. Uh, page seventy-six. Yeah, that <laughs> Thank you, Emory. What's your preference here? Do you want to give us a, uh, a thumbnail, or would you rather us just to ask you a question? I'll give you a quick little okay. overview. Um, we're only two pages in there, so <laughs> mine's probably quicker. So um, the Recreation Department, this time of the year is our, is our uh, great fun time. We're getting ready to kick off all our summer programs, hundreds of kids in sports and summer camps and um, tennis lessons. Um, we're also in charge of Musani Beach, which had a little soft opening last weekend in the nice chilly weather, which will be a lot more, uh, a lot hotter this weekend, hopefully. So we run the beach up in Leeds. Um, we also are a part of the Northampton Family Fourth, which we will have our third um, fireworks celebration this year at Look Park, which um, probably around seven to 8,000 people came to last year. So we're excited to be a part of that each year. Um, we have over 100 programs um, and events throughout the year. Um, with our budget, you'll see we have seven full-time staff in our office. In addition to that, we employ about 90 part-time, 90 to 100 part-time staff throughout the year. And their wages are paid through the recreational fees and charges that are charged for all the programs. Um, and we can't also forget there's about 400 volunteers throughout the year that we rely on to really um, run a lot of the sports programming that we have. Um, Let's see. We also work closely with the Parks and Cemeteries Division of the DPW, which Ned was just speaking about. They do all the maintenance on all the fields. I don't have any maintenance people or maintenance budget, but we work really close with them. Also with the Office of Planning and Development for um, applying for grants and um, funds to help improve rec facilities and opportunities on our, on our, on our town. Um, also, for the past 16 years, we've offered and operated the pool at JFK. Um, this year, that is our one possible area that we're looking at a cut in because the school department has 
um, cut a weekend custodian position <laughs> in their budget, which they have funded uh, as part of when the pool was built 16, 17 years ago. So they have cut that, and we are looking at it. It really severely impacts, obviously, our ability to be able to run programs there. We're working with the mayor um, and his office to um, figure out a way to continue to offer programs at the pool if that cut does go through with them. And um, I guess overall, it's it's been a it's a good year for us. Our um, our programs and our and our people continue to thrive. So any questions you have on anything? Uh, um, hmm? Thank you for being here. Yep. And how much money did you make at the 4th of July at Look Park last year? Um, it basically covered the costs. Okay. It was somewhere around between twenty to 25000 that we raised with the committee, which is Priscilla Ross is the chairperson who does the major bulk of the work. So, um, And we're, we're uh, currently fundraising now to cover this year's budget. So, okay. yep. Also, um, in question because I had received a call from a resident of mine who got a call from another resident and my council president, I went to him directly on something that I needed to put in a butt right away before something like this would have got bigger and bigger and bigger because of the prop two and a half that's gonna go on the ballot, okay? Anyways, the call I received was that down in the fields, the Allen and Bean Farm, there was loam, that's what I was told, loam that was being sold at a dollar and a half, um, I think it was like cubic yards, okay? I got a hold of the mayor's office, they helped me, Joe Cook did, got a hold, I think, of you in regards to what actually occurred there, all right? The sale was, what, 4,000 to 5,000 cubic yards of soil, it was not loam. I was able, thank goodness for Joe Cook, to get the soil testing on it, so I could actually prove to these two male residents that this is what's happened here, it's not loam, this is what it was bidded on at a dollar and a half, so how much did you actually sell, what was the total cost, and is it in your budget, or where is it going? Um. I don't have the total right in front of me. I think it was around dollars, dollars that came in. I can't remember the total of the loan. It was around three, a little over 3,000, 3,500 um, cubic yards of it. Of the, it's not loam. It was the, the soil that was there. It was excess soil. Um, right, because that, on, on the soil testing, I mean, it was not good soil. Right, anyway. no, it wasn't, it wasn't anything screened or um, we actually had to add a, a lot of compost to that project up there to bring the soil up to par for us to use it on the fields there. And that's why it was sold at a yeah. dollar and a half. Yep. It went out to bid and it was sold. So um, that money will go into an account and then we'll request from city council that the money comes back to the Florence Fields to help um, finance the, we're gonna be putting in a in fundraising for the building and um, <coughs> concessions and restrooms and a playground and a pavilion. So we'll be requesting to to get it back to thank that you, account and thank your department for everything that you do didn't the bid doc document say it was loam for the yeah um i'm not sure what it what exactly the wording was it had it had the um soil okay. test with it so it was okay i don't know the wording okay this is that right here Okay, and since the uh, since the construction of the pool, what, what is that? That pool override is paid off. I think uh, Christopher Susan Wright, 2017. 2016, I think JFK is done. Uh, uh, 2017. Susan Wright said 2016. 2016. I'm just, I'm just yes. repeating it for the yep. television. So. Oh no, JFK 2016. FY 2016. Yeah. 2016. Okay. So that that expires 2016. What have you seen? What has changed in the operation of the pool since its construction to now, as far as the programming goes? And, and what has happened with the availability for? I know there was huge concern and many questions prior to the override vote that authorized the construction. Mm -hmm. Have we kept up with all of the promises that we made at the time prior to construction? 
before the override was passed. Are we still doing that or not? Oh yeah, the we still have um, a lot of programming that goes on there. Um, it's whenever school's not in session. So we've gotten squeezed a little bit more by school time during the week. They've, they've moved some of their um, programming around. So now they go in, for instance, first period where we used to be able to program a little bit later in the morning. So we go in at six in the morning, most mornings until about 7.45. So we used to be able to be in there until 8.15, 8.30. Um, so that's gotten cut a little bit. Our weekends have been cut down a couple hours since the beginning by the, um, because of the custodian time being cut in the school department. So the weekend time is, is still there, it's just been cut a little bit. Um, but we, have, we still have offered the programming, the opportunities for the community that we could with the time constraints that we, we have from the schools. Okay, so, so the high school, uh, our diving team. Yep. Now, what do they have for hours? You, is it like, it, I understand it's like 9.45 at night, is that correct? No, they go in after the swim team when they're in season, they go in after school and it's worked out that they're in there and partial part of the pool while our, while the um, community swim lessons or water aerobics are another part of the pool. So they've, they've learned to kind of share until five or 5.30. Um, at one point they were trying to figure out if they could come in later at night so that it wasn't, wouldn't affect the public's time as much. Um, but it's sort of worked the kinks out over the past few years, so they're there after school. So whatever obligation to the voters and the taxpayers when they when we they approved the override mm -hmm. in the schools bill, you're comfortable that we have held up our end. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. We've done the programming it, that so we promised. The questions I yeah. get, they're, yeah. they're asking me why yep. this and why that. I, I think that the programming is there that was talked about if this cut goes through with the school department and cutting the weekends, you know, and the mayor can maybe talk about that a little bit more, Susan, but you know, that will be an issue okay. in, in another two months if that goes through because if we can't operate on weekends, yeah. um, okay. then Thank you, um, our promise isn't being met. <laughs> Those are quite a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. Also, mm -hmm. explain the relationship between Grow Food, Northampton, and the recreation department in relationship to the community gardens and their authority the, as to what they can do with the property and the materials on the property so the recreation commission has a lease agreement um, with grow food northampton that they every year um, there's, a, there's a set of rules and guidelines and regulations and then it's looked at every year by the commission. Um, Grow Food would come to them, and um, it, it mandates things like the um, the fees that can be charged there, um, different you know the materials and the look of it, and things that were are supposed to be done as the years go on since they just started it last year. So the commission has the authority, and then when Grow Food wants to change things or has you know wants to do some kind of um, maintenance or things, sometimes they'll come depending on what it is, if it's in the agreement, they'll come to the rec commission and ask. That particular piece is all in a floodplain. So who, re who is, does the regulator, who is the overseer or the engineer that would look at compensatory flood storage, material moved in and material moved out? Who's responsible for that? I would assume it would be the Conservation Commission and the Office of Planning and Development. They oversee mm. okay. those kinds of... Um, I was just, yeah. it's just a question that I get asked. Yeah. And who, who so, so you don't have any authority that you don't run the community gardens? Not the ones on Meadow Street. We run the ones up on Burt's Pit Road um, at the old state hospital. So people get, get confused with those. We still run, we still run those. We have a committee and we're so in charge of those. Who runs the one on Meadow Street? Grow Food Northampton? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so nobody has any authority over how they run that operation it's just there are some regulations the ultimate authority there Depends on the question is about, about screening mm -hmm. um, on spring street mm -hmm. um, which hasn't happened which is in the plan yep. and i'm curious as to why the screening has not happened there it was supposedly going to happen prior to the plots or lots being leased out and it hasn't happened I'm not and sure now we, we've expanded it even further 
we'd have to look at what the we'd have to look at what the agreement says and what the you know whether it was like over a three-year period that they were to be planted and grow or I, I'm not sure without having it in front of me so we can certainly take a look at it okay. I'm just curious is there yeah point of, is there a budget related question well, here yeah kind of um, okay. I'm wondering just again who's selling the material off the lot and who's keeping the money and where it's going uh, is there a swap with the city uh, it's a lease agreement um, I was under the impression that the Recreation Department had leased the land from Grow Food in Northampton and they were running um, the uh, community gardens as they ran the one at the State Hospital and then come to find out when I had asked the question a few weeks ago I find out that the Recreation Department holds the lease to the land and Grow Food Northampton is running it and they owned it in the first place and then Recreation Department leased it and now Grow Food Northampton is still running it. So I, I, it was confusing to me. It was more than confusing I think, when I found out that the recreation. Can I? I, uh, I think the planning department has has all the details. And the money and the, if, and the transfer of funds know. and all that back and forth. Okay, I'll find out. Um, yeah, I'm more than happy to take this up in in the culture and rec committee if if it, if if you'd like, Councilor Tacey. Absolutely, because uh, I, j I just get bombarded with questions. Every time somebody drives by and they see a truck coming well, out. Well, we can, we can, we can take that. Uh, Council Freeman, as you want to continue the floor. Yeah, can I, can we? Thank you. Can we get, um, can you give us a little bit more clarity about what it means to lose uh, a custodian on the weekends at JFK? And, well, I mean, it sounds as though you're hinting that, that, pro that you're, not, you're not expecting programming to take place this, this year. Or this upcoming fiscal year but I can't I haven't heard you say it yet right well they the school department is cutting their they pay for the weekend custodian always have it's always been a part of the programming when it when the pool was built 17 years ago that they would we would do the programming and they would um, pay for the, the custodian okay so if there's no custodian the, the doors aren't open right. is that the exactly. idea they have there's to open the door they have to um, read all you know to maintain all the pool area, read all the um, the stuff on the on the pumps and things like that. So and right. so obviously, if the, if there's no one there at the building, right. you can't do programming on the weekends. Right. Exactly. So what what are you looking at? You have to cut something then. Do you, the mayor? Well, I've been working with the mayor for a plan for if the school de, if, if the school department does go through with the cut, which I think is their plan. We've been speaking about what could possibly be done. On the city side, with fees and different things. Um, if you'd like me to address, I think he the, could. I'm also the chair of the school committee, so I have another yeah. insight on this. So they have indeed cut this, um, and this has been a perennial um, item that's on the, it tends to be on the chopping block every time there's a uh, you know during the past years of budget uh, negotiation. So we have, uh, and I've indicated to the school committee that this, while it has while it helps save them money, it has a larger impact. Uh, citywide because of the effect on the rec department program. So we have, um, in talking with the superintendent and their finance director, their business director, we've reached an agreement that if the override um, is successful, that we would actually ask them to, to transfer the funds uh, into the central services department, and we would, we would actually manage that custodial position going forward, just so that it's not no longer every year becomes this uh, this item that's on the chopping block. So that's one discussion we've had. But of course, that's subject to whether the override passes or not. It's about $15,000, we estimate, is the actual. I know that there's been this report of $40,000. That's because there's a $40,000 custodial cut. But that's not just the weekend custodian. It's, it's other positions within the school department. So it's not a $40,000 position for that. It's about, we estimate about $15,000. So we're going to work with them if the override is successful to try to absorb that. If the override is not successful, that's a whole other issue that we have to talk about internally about whether, and we've had many citizens say, raise my fees. You know, I'd rather raise my swimming fees. I'd rather pay more to have access, you know, to this facility. So that's going to be a conversation depending on what happens on June 25th about how we move forward if we can salvage some of the programs on weekends. Do you mind? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's informative. So, but what, what I'm hearing then is that if the override, the way we're going right now, this budget has, will have to, will will not have 
that programming under the current fee structure. So what, what kind of fee structure would we, I mean, how much of an increase in fee would you expect to, to, have to, to make to cover th this kind of position? Um, I, would f I would foresee some kind of um, special events and fundraising taking place because you, know, you can't go up too much in your fees because then you're out, you know, out pricing yourself with everyone else around who's doing the same kinds of things. So um, I would foresee um, you know, some of the fees would have to go up. You know, the, the, um, we have yearly membership fees. We have um, that are, are big. We have some rentals, like birthday parties and things that really actually are a big part of um, the income. So we would, you know, take a look at those kinds of things to see what could really absorb fee increases and what programs couldn't. So along with maybe some nice special event or something that would try to fundraise for some of it. But 15000 is a lot for our little, for our little department. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, what is that, about a 7% increase? In all, right. all the operations at the pool are covered by our fees. Everything is. Um, Nothing is, nothing comes from um, the general fund. Everything op is operated out of a revolving fund for the pool, for our part of it. And the revolving fund is, uh, is, that, is that about $100,000, is that right? The pool no, part I'm of seeing, it? I'm, look, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at the, at the sources for the revolving fund in your budget. It looks like about 92000 or is that just, is that under? You have a larger one than that. Yes, right. Yeah, we. That's just to pay these salaries. Is that right? right? That are shown there. Yes. Not all the part-time people and. Um, so, so what is that. that? What is the total revolving fund? Uh, um. The pool one. Yeah, for the pool. I am. Probably about 30, 35, 000, 30 to forty thousand. Thirty to forty thousand. I'm hearing in my ear, but I'm not. <laughs> So to go and add, to add 15 extra thousand dollars is anywhere from a uh, looks like a 35 to, to 50 percent increase. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have the. Okay. But that's I mean, is that, significant is that rough? Is that roughly speaking a third, no. a third to a half again increase in in the the amount of revenue you need to collect? I think so. That's significant. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions <coughs> More. Mm -hmm. Do you recollect uh, the $94,000 that we paid for the lease? Was there any restriction on that money to grow food in Northampton? Was there a certain thing that they were <coughs> utilizing more or not? Just, I mean, you were the. Oh, for the CPA? <coughs> yeah, it was CPA money. I don't. I don't. I don't recall what, without looking at it, what the regulations are around it. I know there was two. It's a substantial amount of money. I mean, it's ninety-four thousand dollars once in one hundred and four thousand just prior to that. It would be on the CPA website. Yeah. They list all the. Would there be a copy of the lease? Yeah. Online. Uh, I'm not sure if planning has that online or not. They put everything. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll check. Thank you. Are there any questions? Emory, thank you so much for your Thank time. you. Right. It. Thank you. We're back. We're coming out of recess. The City Council FY 2014 budget hearing for Wednesday, May 29th, 2013. I'm City Council President Bill Dwight presiding. Um, next up on the agenda is uh, the Council on Aging. Patty Shaughnessy is here. That'll be page 67 on your budget book there. Patty, hello. hello thank you. Good evening. Glad to see you all. Glad to be here. Um, well, I've been offering people coming to speak to us an option of giving us a thumbnail or they can just open up to questions. Uh, what's your preference? Uh, well, I've passed out a blue packet of information, so if I can briefly go through that, it'll give you some highlights about uh, the department, and when I say department, Council on Aging and Senior Center. Um, and then I would certainly welcome questions. Um, on your left-hand side, there's a pamphlet in uh, May is Older Americans Month, at least for a couple more days. Um, and it, we always offer a lot of special uh, events, workshops, um, informational sessions during that month. And one of the bigger things that we do during the Older Americans Month is our Health and Safety Fair, which is actually the largest event that we have both for exhibitors and for 
uh, participants, meaning seniors, their families, and the community. And that was just held May 23rd. And that's a booklet that we pass out. We get advertisements in that, and that's pretty much how that gets paid for. On the first page, it's just at a glance. It gives some um, highlights of uh, let's say units of service in the fitness center, 6,365. It means of all the members we have in total, that's how many times since July 1st to May 23rd uh, individuals came into the fitness center to use it, which is uh, outstanding. And a lot of those people are waiting at the door at 8.15 to get into the building. So I think that speaks highly of the fitness center. Uh, medical transportation rides provided to seniors, 415. That's all done by volunteers who are trained um, and provide medical transportation um, to various doctors, dentists, uh, medical appointments. Um, and then um, I know that the mayor brought the check from the volunteer recognition reception. And um, we're very thankful for all the volunteers that we have. Um, because without them, we wouldn't be able to offer a lot of what we offer, um, especially they're the front line at our reception desk, and typically there are three volunteers at that. You know, we have the coffee shop, the gift shop, and it's all staffed by volunteers. So there's some other numbers there, too, that you can peruse. <clears throat> the next page just uh, provides you information about direct fundraisers that we do. Um, the, the amount that the NCOA comes up for to support comes needs to come up with for our budget. Those are a lot of the ongoing uh, direct fundraisers. Uh, then there's also, it says at the bottom, other cost centers of the senior center, coffee shop, gift shop, rentals, and special dining services. On the back page, um, other income to senior center, fees from classes and programs. And further in this booklet, there's a, a breakdown of some of the classes and how fees are determined, and that was um, at the request of Councilor Labarge. Um, I put that together. Um, and then private and voluntary donations, and we also receive grants. And as of this new fiscal year, um, there are two new endeavors that we're going to be taking over, which will um, assist us financially. And we are taking over the Elder Vision newspaper. Um, Elder Vision Inc., the Friends Group, uh, put that newspaper in terms of paying for it um, and supplementing at times the editor for that uh, newspaper. We're going to be taking that over, which means we're taking over what income comes in from that as well as the expenditures for that. So it's a big undertaking on our part because we won't be able to rely on Elder Vision Inc. If somewhere we fall short of ads or whatever but i have high anticipation that the paper will only get better um, in the in the future which means in july um, and then we're also taking over all the trips and travel which was also under the auspices of elder vision inc the friends group so again doing all the work for trips and travel and um, we'll be receiving the income from that as well as providing the uh, fun funding for the expenditures, which we'll be paying for those trips. Um, our mission statement is in there. Um, I know I put that in last year in your packet. Um, then you have the Senior Center Code of Conduct, um, and this is what we um, expect um, conduct within the Senior Center. This has been voted on by the board from uh, the day the Senior Center opened, and it's been revised as needs come up. So that, that is the code of conduct. The next page, building use, um, 42,679 of that we know of that came into the senior center. We miss a lot of people um, who, who do come in, but that's um, the number that we have logged. Then there's May National Volunteer Month. And again, um, all the volunteers that we have and we welcome uh, what they're able to do for the senior center. And I think we're very fortunate in our community that so many people want to join the ranks of the uh, volunteer workforce at the senior center. And then there's an April and May calendar. So it shows you on one side some of the one-time events that happen in the month. And then um, another page that shows you all of the activities that happen each day throughout the month. And we also add things along the way. Once this is printed, other uh, programs and activities come up. Then the following page, um, it says classes held at the Northampton Senior Center. Um, 
and it breaks down that we're a senior center for Northampton seniors, 60 and older, but we also have opened it up and it's part of our mission statement that we have people 55 to 59 from Northampton join in as well. But we also have opened it up to those seniors from other communities and those from other communities who are 55 to 59. And typically those folks pay a higher fee for anything that we do at the senior center. Again, we're funded to support Northampton seniors and this is a way that our uh, budget can also be um, supplemented. It lists all the classes here, at least since July 1st, 2012, all the classes that we offer for a fee. And um, it says income for classes, group activities, and it excludes the low impact class because Highland Valley Elder Services supplements that class. Um, it gives you the total that has been brought in through May, 20, May 14th, excuse me, and then uh, the expenditures that are part of that. And what are the expenditures? It's paying for the instructors who teach those classes, as well as if we need weights or um, booklets or CDs or whatever for the classes. So those would be the other expenditures. And on the back of that page, income and expenditure examples of some classes, um, there's a list of a few of the classes and how we determine prices in, in terms of the fee. And typically it's 70% goes to the instructor, 30% comes to the senior center. And that's pretty much mirrored after how the recreation department does it. But there are some classes that it may be done a little differently. For instance, when there was bridge, it was $3 and the instructor received $2 and we received $1. So it varies somewhat um, depending on what the class is. And so that again, uh, those fees are all in our activity revolving account and that helps us to supplement our budget. And the next page just shows no fee classes and groups that we have. There are a lot of things we do at the senior center that um, there is no fee um, at all that a, a senior uh, or a participant would be charged. We also have board games that we encourage people to come in and they play in groups. And then lastly, other ways that we receive uh, income building uh, rentals, building monitors uh, cost, because when there's a building rental, we have one or two uh, building monitors, depending how many people are in the uh, building. And right now, um, although we just received two checks for a, a little over $1,000 to add to that for um, through, through uh, April, we just got received payments for those. And then the last page is the budget worksheet um, that um, our budget, and I'm, I'm just going to say that um, with what I was presented with uh, to do my uh, summary, uh, that I worked with the total that I was given, and though there now is some uh, um, uh, information that that was uh, to be reduced, which, which I didn't know what was being, how it was being reduced, but I since have known that. So with the total amount of our budget, um, we need to come up with $92,214. And that's through everything that I just talked about, including grants. So we do usually get um, one or two grants, small grants from Highland Valley Elder Services, which we're thankful for. And then the um, Department of Elder Affairs are what we call the formula grant. And that's based on the number of seniors and currently it's at seven dollars but that may get um, raised to eight dollars which would be wonderful okay uh council labarge patty i want to thank you very much uh, for my request on the fees mm -hmm. and no fees and what is the prices that instructors ac actually make at the senior center and what we get for a price from them also. I appreciate that. I just heard you say something to the effect that you have to what, raise how much, 92,000? Yeah, each, each year we need to come up with a certain amount of money. So we have the city appropriation and then to have what we want in the senior center in terms of staffing, here's what the city provides, the city appropriation, and then anything beyond that is what we come up with. So that 92,000 um, 
plus is what we come up with. And you said you just found out about that? Well, um, I, I, again, I worked with the uh, total amount from last year, the, the bottom line. That's what I worked okay. with. And then I, until I saw this printed on the uh, website, I didn't know that it was really being looked at with how some of that money was being removed when I had my budget hearing. So that, that I didn't know about. Okay. Um, I know I did talk to you. I also talked with our financial director. <coughs> I not just had one resident, I had a couple of residents who had concerns um, of the issue in the editor's paper where apparently that you had stated that there was a reduction of 15,233 with the city appropriation and where the controversy was, it was up on the website, something altogether differently which was the budget showed a 15,332 decrease in funding. Did you not know of that or about that 15,332 and the decrease in the funding? Um, sort of to get back to your the yep. beginning of your question, in Elder Vision, yep. I had put in my um, letter from the um, director yep. that that amount in there was what I believed we we're losing, and that was based on um, the total of 197604 That's what I based my whole budget on. I didn't know until I read this that that's what was being, um, well, how, let me back up again on that one. So when I had my meeting with administration, I knew it was getting cut, but I didn't know specifically, specifically. how. But I do know that from this um, budget that was on the uh, website. So that I do understand. So if, if there is a controversy around that total amount that I said our budget was getting decreased, that's because uh, the budget was based on 197.604. So, I mean, I understand uh, what that was, um, done, what was done to the budget. Okay, so at the $20,000 of the comp time, yep. is that where there was a problem there too? Was that? Yeah, that's like, that, that was indicated on the uh, website. For my budget so that was in there and then the um, to cover salary increases for staff and, I, and I'm not sure what that is but you know that's that's in there so I'm going with that so you're I, I, I know I, the, I'm the, asking the, you because there perhaps, was a problem I know. with language in the paper and in the book right so. I'm asking you as a city councilor okay you did not know about this extra language until you actually saw it on the web, correct? That's correct. I didn't know specifically when I was uh, working on the budget with administration that it was being cut. I knew that, but I didn't know where it was being cut uh, or why. And I think only the mayor could answer that or maybe uh, Susan Wright. Could I ask the mayor, please? And then we'll know. Uh, this is the budget worksheet that we've been working with in all of our meetings, and I've, you know, I'm fairly confident I've talked with uh, business uh, uh, finance director you know I, I'm fairly clear we were working on a number of other issues but I'm yeah, I'm fairly clear that we discussed that the uh, that the that the one-time uh, expenditure and you may also remember we eliminated um, a position last year which was the business manager position um, which uh, was eliminated and we used the savings from that to for that one-time payout um, so you'll notice that there's no net decrease in the um, in the FTEs, and so mm -hmm. I I'm not sure what I can attribute to the miscommunication there, other than uh, this is the budget sheet that we've been working off of in our meetings. Okay. So thank you, Mayor. Uh, which is and why we tried to clarify that in our budget book. Yes, mm -hmm. because with the concerns I had with a couple of residents and one going in to see Susan and I sitting there, we needed to get that straightened out. So it is straightened out. So the, I know the budget that has been proposed by the mayor and um, what it entails and what the end result is um, for the bottom line. Patty, you lost a position last year, correct? The business manager, yes. What has it done to your department? Well, what it has done is, um, you know, pushed that work. The intent was that the director and the assistant director would take on more financial responsibilities. 
Um, and uh, the department secretary pretty much does m most all the financials as well. But each staff person has a program that they're responsible for. For instance, med uh, the uh, companion program, so they handle all of the invoices and the um, documentation that then goes to the department secretary. So we all have a hand in um, doing the finances. You know, so it, it has created more um, mathematical uh, time for people to uh, staff to have to work with that. But um, what it does too is the department secretary really can't do anything but financial stuff. I know when we went into Susan um, in her office, my resident and I, he asked, actually, who did you have a bookkeeper? We don't do you have, have a bookkeeper. We don't have a staff bookkeeper, but I have a volunteer who since uh, 2004 has been helping us with our finances. Both, uh, she's the one who goes to the bank for us. She's very trustworthy. Um, she's a wonderful um, volunteer and we say every day, we hope she never leaves because she does a good bulk of all of the uh, financials. And again, um, you know, at the front desk, people are handling all the payments coming in, and you know we have to really trust and feel secure with the people that are volunteers working with our, our funds. Also, too, on the home repair, I think Jim Ross, mm -hmm. wasn't he the, ins what was he, an inspector? He, he was the home repair inspector. Because I know on social services and veterans affairs, Peg Keller had brought it up to three of us counselors in regards to the loss of that position and um, looking at why it did not continue because she's saying that it is needed out there. Um, two things happened with the home repair program, which was a program that we could offer loans and grants to seniors who had larger projects like a roof to be repaired, a furnace to be replaced, uh, updated wiring, um, updated plumbing. And so the business manager was also the home repair coordinator and so some weeks she might have been doing three hours of work other weeks it could have been 20 hours of work depending upon what kind of um, uh, interaction she was having with people who had a need and so because of two things one that person was um, removed from the budget and also the reduction in each year the home repair money it, it really wasn't um, financially feasible for us to continue that and I'm not saying it wasn't needed but it would have only benefited a few people and for the amount of work it would not have and not that it was hard work it's just that for the amount of time invested in each and everything um, that was that position eliminated also eliminated the home repair but we, we provide information as we always have to individuals who may need um, assistance with who can they talk to about getting a furnace replaced or who can they talk to about getting a roof and we hook up people with you know really contractors that we used to work with who could help them and be reasonable and honest um, also I know you have some of your board members here oh, yes. and you have some volunteers I want to thank them all Thank them all from the Senior Center, every volunteer, every employee, for all the amount of hours that they work tirelessly to make that Senior Center what it is. I think as a director that you need to look at this very, very carefully of the amount of money that they, hours, which accumulated to a tremendous amount of money that the city would have had to pay if they had to hire people to do what they did, okay, to keep it going. And that total amount was how much? 300 and what? Well, the, for what we have to put into it is- No, what sorry. they raised, all the volunteers. Oh, the hours. Yes, yeah. which was a money. Oh, in terms of the money, yeah. Exactly. But a, a volunteer in Massachusetts is worth, yes. Yeah. Quite a bit. Yeah. You know, and I think at some point they should be recognized, come to city council mm -hmm. and recognize every employee at the senior center who has made it what it is all about. I, I do believe the staff works very hard and it's a great team who produces a lot to um, engage seniors in our community. Patty, how, how are you going to do your fundraising to raise 
I'm a little concerned here about 92,214. How yep. are you going to do that fundraising? Well, we are if we get at least $8 per senior, that's about 41,000 and $8 per senior for 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 per senior times 8 uh, I'm going to say $7 because we'll go with the lower um, is about a little over 41,000 that I don't really need to worry about so it's everything beyond that but we every year that we've been down at the senior center I have to project what I think all of these fundraisers can do our annual appeal I don't really know how people are going to donate but I can kind of project what I think and then okay so there isn't enough money coming in from one of the uh, projected fundraisers then we figure out um, another one and then it, you know there are times when we have a, truly a generous community who uh, near the end of the year start sending in um, checks to um, benefit the senior center there are a lot of I mean, did you ever have to make this amount of money before? yes uh -huh. so then that's not a problem well, I'm not going to say it's not a problem. <laughs> you do. Um, because yeah, truly. You've done it, right? But you've Realistically, done it. if you're in human services, you're raising money. Is it fair? Probably not, but it's reality. The thing is that um, you look at what you need to raise, and then you do it, and you figure out all the ways you can do it. Okay. Also on your health and safety fair, mm -hmm. I asked you about what you were charging on the rental on the tables which was $20, and I talked with you today. I really think you should raise that price. There's no reasons why it can't be done, and there's more money being generated there. You had at least over 53 um, people that came in mm -hmm. on rental, correct? Right. Except it, for anybody from the city of Northampton didn't have to pay correct. for rental, correct. right? So yeah, it's something to look at. Yeah, we'll, we'll put that on our list. We evaluate every program after it happens. So that's on the list already. Thank you. Yeah. Council Murphy, then Council Freeman. Mm -hmm. Just a, you had a vacant assistant director's position early in 13, right? Mm -hmm. FY13. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But you fill that position now? Yes. Um, oh, yes. Okay. So that's back. So the business manager went away and stayed away, but oh. you did fill your assistant director yes. position. So yes. that's stable now. So at present, we're just a little over the seven FTEs that we we were budgeted for last year. Right. So all the positions are now filled. Right, right. Okay. That assistant director was budgeted for, but it has been. But filled. it wasn't filled, but now it is. It so is. we're yep. we're back to our seven, just over seven. Yeah, the former social worker uh, Crystal Cody Soth is the person who um, is the. Per I'm sorry, Stas. Stowes. She just got married, so we're getting used to her name. Um, Stowes. Crystal Cody Stowes um, was the social worker, and she um, became the assistant okay. director. So you filled her position, yes. and, and so we're stable at just over seven. Yes. Okay. Good. We're stable. <laughs> stable. Thank you. Uh, uh, why, how is it that you spend so little on the telephone? Five hundred sixty-four dollars. All these other budgets: twelve hundred dollars, thousand dollars, fifteen hundred dollars for mm -hmm. telephone. Why you're not spending much on the telephone? We have one cell phone that's used on the van, and that's it. Oh, that's okay. all we have. Um, what's? I, I'm I'm not sure if I understand the budget worksheet because I, I see, that, in in this upcoming fiscal year, you're expecting ninety-two thousand, two hundred fourteen dollars. Is that right? Yes. On our side. Right, to, to those are sources, that's the 92,000. Other, the, the, other sources, yes. Right. Um, did, were you talking about this earlier then? The budget book has you re raising 94,955. Is that what you were talking about earlier? Because mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, because I was, I was uh, preoccupied. So I'm going to say I have 92214 So you're saying it's another um, 2000 Well, our budget book shows 94955 uh, okay. So it's like a, a, like a $2.7,000 difference. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay, I, and I do have that figure over here. Okay. So, so, the so now ask me if I'm concerned. <laughs> so that's so, okay. so that is correct. Yeah, so this is a different budget sheet that I have here. Yeah, so you are correct. It is 
ninety-four thousand nine hundred. Oh, so that's the one. That's the one. That, that is correct. Final, all right. Thank you. So I'll adjust that, and we'll. Come so it's just your worksheet was a preliminary number or something. It like was. That. So now I've been duly recognized right. that it's ninety ninety-four. Partway through the budget process, um, I wanted to increase the position of the um, senior publications. So um, more money was going to come into the revolving fund, so we agreed to have the position increased by 0.2. So there's a little bit more money that's coming out of revolving funds, but there's more money going into the revolving funds because now we're going to have two new revolving funds that you have orders for. One is senior publications and another one is trips and travel. So the increase in her staff that was approved by the mayor is offset by increased revenue coming in. So that's why the number last year it was 92,000 and this year it's 94. So it's only gone up a couple of thousand more, but that shouldn't be a problem with the new, with the new right. revolving right. funds. I'm so sorry, what was increased 0.2, 20, something's increased by 20%? Um, the it went from 30 hours to 35 hours for the senior publications. It's a media and marketing person because we're taking on, thank you, Susan, for um, that reminder. Um, we're taking on the newspaper, which also means that we need to increase the revenue through ads and pounding the pavement to get people to... Um, in the business directory and whatnot so, so that's that as Susan pointed out is how um, that has increased from my total to uh, recognizing the additional five hours for that position okay. and so um, the concern that the revenue will be coming from um, elder vision newspaper that's but that's like a that's like a 12% increase right not a 20% increase well, it's well, okay, that's fine. But it's I understand for an additional going. five hours. So you're, you're you're taking on the newspaper. Yes. So you take in more revenue, but you have to have people to sell the ad space. Right. So the the person who's the marketing media does all of the um, publication, which the Elder Vision is one. She's the one who did this health and safety booklet, and it is what helps bring revenue into the senior center. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Tacey. Uh, Building rentals, mm -hmm. July to April, 2650. How many rentals is that? Is that um, I, I can look that up. I couldn't really tell you uh, off the top I mean, of my head. It's, 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 it looks like an anemic number, 2650 bucks for the facility. It just doesn't look like there was... Is there a lot of rentals? Uh, is, you know, um, I'm going to say since July of 2012, there's been fewer rentals. One, because of um, the staff time it takes to put on a rental. And, you know, I think as a staff, we want to provide more direct service. And we're not really in the rental business, but we realize that rentals support our budget. So there are fewer rentals. And also, I have a concern about renting um, to various groups. One, because I can never guarantee that we have heat or air conditioning. So that's always um, up in the air. It's difficult. Can you explain it? Can you never guarantee you have heat? Right, you could, you, because we're a state-of-the-art um, AC heating system, that um, there are times when if, if you need something uh, like the heat to be left on on a Saturday or you need the air conditioning on on a Saturday or even let's take the health and safety fair, I call to ask that it is, you know, the air conditioning is um, keeping people cool. If in the great room in the lobby you have 300 people between the two rooms, the air conditioning, you need to ask for it to be programmed so that it stays cooler. And um, I don't know what happened, but at the health and safety fair, it was very warm. And uh, it, uh, in the evaluation forms, that's pretty much what most of the um, exhibitors had said, wow, it's really warm in here. So we hear that often in the building. It's, it's a new building, and the system is new um, and complicated. So that, that's what I can say. I can never say to somebody or feel confident that there's going to be air conditioning if they ask for it. That really throws me for a loop. Brand new building, I can't understand that. I don't know just exactly how that, um, how that could possibly be. And, and I will say Jason Doyle is wonderful. He hears from me um, like at the Health and Safety Fair. I must have called him three times that day and two times maybe the day before. But, you know, he does his best. And, you know, sometimes it has to do with the carbon dioxide in the... Um, 
in the room from people breathing or the air from the outside to the inside. And it, it's very, very complicated and most of it's over my head. Um, regardless of whether it's over somebody's head, there should be some, somebody should have some responsibility for what the installation or the engineering was involved in it. And why isn't it not functioning? I just recommend that you're going to have Mr. Pomerantz. Yes. In. He okay. would probably be a good one okay. to talk to because Patty's obviously not an HVAC right. expert. Not so yet. Not yep. yet. <laughs> but, she but will it, be. It's not to put yeah. her on the spot about But it, it is, I, I understand that, but it is related to the budget. In, yeah. Except the heating and is paid for out of the central service. Yeah. I mean, if you can't provide air conditioning to a client, they're not going to come to you. They're going to exactly. go somewhere else. Okay. And another question uh, medical transportation rides provided. Mm -hmm. To seniors, <clears throat> there is a there's a lapse somewhere in, our, in the coverage that does not allow for uh, transportation from a specialized care facility to another specialized care facility or to a therapist or whatever. It's not covered by insurance. It is only covered if you go from the nursing home to the hospital. Mm -hmm. But if uh, you go from a, from the nursing home to another to a doctor's appointment. It's not covered by insurance. So is, is this is this part of what you do? Do you uh, medical transportation is provided to seniors um, pretty much who are at home, um, or they may need a ride home from the hospital, and it's done by volunteers. Um, there's not supposed to be any lifting or um, folding up wheelchairs and putting them in a car because people don't have the capacity to do that as volunteers. But in terms of um, some of the um, assisted living or nursing homes, we don't provide transportation because that's up to that facility. People are paying uh, for that service within that facility. So if somebody from um, Rockridge, for example, um, wants a medical transportation ride, it's up to Rockridge to provide that. We'll do transportation at Rockridge for our low vision group because it's a program, but not for medical transportation because facilities have the responsibility because people are paying for um, their care and that's transportation should be part of their care. Okay, and the $92,000 that you need to raise. Um, 94,000 something that is. Yes, 94,000. It's gone up. Uh, none of that is covered in the income expenditure example, like the low impact fitness class, none of that is mm -hmm. none of that is involved in this, is it? Yes, it is. Yeah, um, we have a number of revolving accounts. Mm -hmm. Activity uh, revolving account is one of those, and all of the fees go into that, um, as well as that's where the rentals go into, um, as well. So there's a number of items that go in activity, and then we have the coffee shop, and that helps pay for the needs of the senior center and salaries. Same with the gift shop. Food services, meaning, for instance, at the health and safety fair, a group of volunteers, um, we put a menu together, and so that money will help to support the budget. So that brings it down to that forty thousand dollar figure that you're down to, right? Because we have that grant money of forty one thousand. Yeah. So, yes. Okay. And now, is it the E uh, E E O A? Is that the one that may come up to a do another it, dollar? It, it may come up to eight dollars. Yeah. So in 2010, we are very fortunate because the senior population of Northampton increased by over 900 people. Um, but we have since seen Northampton Nursing Home close, but we'll be seeing the assisted living center start um, being built and be included up on, uh, uh, I call it Hospital Hill, but I know it has a thing. Village, Village, Village Hill. Village. So, you know, people come and go, but a lot of seniors have moved to Northampton to be closer to family or because this is a great city to live in. Thank you. Well, will that will that grant just continue to happen? I mean, is that it's a standard grant. State? We have to apply for it, and you know, you have to be very specific about what you're going to use it for. But um, I've been the director since 2001, and it has existed since then. And that's from the state, is that right? It's from the state. Yeah. Um, the only thing you can worry about is that the legislature is going to decrease it, and that has happened in previous years. But Councilor Tacey, you all set? I think. Uh, I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Council of Bar. Yes. Um, Patty, have you seen an increase of seniors now coming into the senior center? Yes. Yeah. Um, now that we have my senior center, well, to begin with, we weren't getting everyone to really comply um, to uh, scan in, but there's a, a, a better usage of it. So it'll be interesting to see um, with that what we end up with at June 30th. So yes, and I, I will say that there are a lot of people who have never been in the senior center and they come in and they say, I don't know why I wasn't here before. 
And some people you see them once a week, other people you see them every single day, and some people you see twice a day. Thank you, Pam. So the city did a great investment in that senior center. So thank you all, whether you were part of it when it was voted on or you're part of it now supporting the budget. I just want to add that I have a particular vantage point um, in my capacity in the Western Mass Network and Homelessness, which uh, we contribute to the Senior Center and use their meeting space. And I just want to say that it's been an extraordinary resource for the work, both in, on behalf of Northampton's population uh, that are experiencing at risk of homelessness and for the whole region. And people from Boston um, on to the farthest reaches of the West are, are continually impressed by the facility and the service and the resource that it offers the community. So it's a real source of pride. Um, for all of the people working on housing and homelessness issues across the state. So thank you for that. Are there any other questions? Patty, thank you so much for your time. And thank you to the board members for coming in as well. Sitting through budget hearings, I imagine, doesn't count as part of the entertainment budget. But uh, I appreciate your, your, your presence here. Uh, thank you. Okay, well, thank you all very much. And Susan, thank you for orienting me about that additional have a cup out the door. And now we come up to uh, the tax collector. This is here. That's uh, page 33 on your budget. Well, so you didn't bring a potty? A posse? No. Patty yeah, brought where's your posse? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. You don't offer a lot of entertainment. No. I they always come in and give me handouts. something. I don't give much out. <laughs> handouts. No handouts, no seats. Well, thank you for candy. coming. Sometimes candy. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm, I don't know if you heard, but we're giving you the option to give us a thumbnail sketch, or you can just open up to questions, whatever your preference is. Which okay. Thumbnail works for me because. You certainly know me and you know my budget. So <laughs> it doesn't change much. We were asked to level fund. And of course, we had um, certain union contracts that were going to get something. So we had to. What's the page that you find that's in? 33. 33. We had to up our PS, which is personal services, and you know, find the way to level fund by cutting something in the bottom. Um, my budget, I'll start with the collectors because I also had a parking clerk under me. Right. Um, I have a full staff, uh, three principal clerks, myself and my assistant, and I, I ended up with the parking garage kind of dis disassembled. I took one of the clerks that was over there, the clerk that was over there, so she's in my office and I have two others, and um, my assistant is going to school. I have to go every year to keep accredited and she's going to become an accredited assistant collector. So we're doing that every year, every summer at UMass. Um, the bottom of my contract, the ordinary maintenance, as you call it, um, it's pretty standard. I mean, I have printing. I have to print all my bills, which is real estate, personnel, excise, um, boat excise. Um, I have to print demands, and I have to print, um, I have to have envelopes specially printed with returns and coatings and everything else to get a qualified low rate and everything that goes along with that. So my printing, and my postage are my main characters. Um, I have some advertising. Um, the service bureau fees relate to the parking clerk's office. It's in my side of the budget. It's basically a three-year contract with a company, and they provide two computers, two printers, adding machine tapes, everything for the parking. So if a computer dies, we just call them up and they send us a new one. So it's very cost savings. They also send out demands themselves they provide online services for people to pay their tickets, so that helps people. Um, we're just looking into, we're just starting to get some information about credit cards in the parking clerk's office at the counter, because there's a lot of people that come in and want to do that. And when they're marked at the registry or their car has a boot on it, they don't want to fool around. You know, they get a little anxious if you tell them, I'm sorry, I don't take credit cards. So that's what we're working on. We just had a presentation today, in fact, and we're probably going to try to stick with People's Bank because that's who we do most of my deposits in anyway. Um, on my collector side, I already have been using credit cards since about February at the counter. Um, I also have been using for about two to three years online payments, which can come out of a check or come out of a credit card. People seem to like it. Um, 
works for me. I download files. I upload it into our operating system. It's all correlated, which is good. Um, unfortunately, there are fees, um, and we can't absorb them. So the customer has to pay fees. Um, debit cards are a flat fee of $3.95 per transaction. If somebody comes in with two um, excise bills, we'll add them together and charge them the total, so they're only paying $3.95. Credit cards are based on the size of the bill, roughly 3%, roughly. So if you're paying a $3,000 tax bill, you're going to be paying a lot of money in a fee. People will do it for the convenience. Maybe they get a lot of mileage. I don't know. So, But if they pay online using a check, it's $0.25. Cents. And that just started in January. It was free for about a year. And... Um, Unfortunately, people aren't happy, and I understand that, but I try to tell them that it's going to cost you 40-some-odd cents to mail it. It's going to cost you X number of dollars to drive down here and hopefully get a parking spot. So, you know, you try to, you know, please pay online. It's much easier for us. Um, every collector in the state, and we address this every summer at UMass, every collector has a problem with the bank's online checks. Um, they come in. If the person doesn't fill it out correctly, we don't know what they're paying. Some of them put pay to the order of Northampton. I don't know what account they want, you know. So then we have to go through all the accounts. We have to try to match it. Um, some people pay, you know, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, so we can't match anything. We just have to assume that's what they want to pay. Then they call up and say, I already paid that, so we have to flip things around. So all the collectors are trying to figure out a way to change that. I don't know that we have yet. Um, this summer we'll hopefully bring some more because we have stacks and it takes time it takes like a full-time person to go through all those so that's what we're working on to try to fix that with the statewide um, I'm a city collector which means I can collect almost anything that the city wants me to so um, trash a landfill is going away as we all know I think it's gone um, there's some lingering bills but now I'm collecting for trash bags certain stores there's about eight of them are now selling trash bags and the DPW used to have a middleman handling the bags going to the stores the stores paying they've decided to stop that and so they're actually billing each individual store and the store is paying and it's coming through my office which is fine eight is a lot easier than about 45 when it was landfill so we're taking on that um, the parking clerk's office they have Ah, uh, let's see. My uh, let me go back to my budget. My budget went down about forty eight hundred dollars, um, mostly coming out of postage, and coming out. I have to have some money because the bid bills that are done every three months are figured and printed in my office, and we have a man that writes a crystal program, a crystal reporting program to make the bid bills work. And they're um, in our MUNA system, but they're not part of the tax bill because that's illegal. So we have to pay this gentleman who works on Crystal Reports. So that's about two to three hundred dollars every three months. So some of that is built into some of my budget at this point. Um, but that's about it for my budget. It's pretty simple. Parking clerk has had four full-time people, and then it went down to three, and now we're back up to four full-time um, some new ones that just came on within the last couple of months um, that's a horrendous job horrendous <laughs> parking tickets cause a lot of grief with the public and I don't know why maybe because they're mad at themselves for being five minutes late but you do get quite some interesting con you know confrontations out on the street um, I read in the paper this morning that somebody thought that the parking enforcement people should be shooing people off the benches I don't think that's going to work. So anyway, um, we were also um, took over about a three-hour a night job. He goes out at night and he works for us um, as a parking enforcement officer. Otherwise, he's working with the garage maintenance group. Um, and we have another part-time PEO that we just hired, a retired police officer from out of town. And he's doing really well. He likes it. I mean, when you interview for that job, you have to look at people and realize that they're going to see the worst. So you have to really try to get somebody with a thick skin, kind of calm, able to shrug it off because the stress is unbelievable. So right now we're running really well in, in parking. Um, we have in the parking uh, budget, there's a uniform allowance. That's a contractual thing and it's 475 per person. 
or 450 per person and we just had a bunch of um, jackets winter jackets that we found in the garage and downstairs in our office area and so we took them out and had them cleaned so hopefully we can reuse those so that'll save some money because the 450 barely covers a full year of all the seasons and you know raincoats and shoes and everything else so in cleaning they have to clean their own stuff so except for you know dry cleaning so basically that's what parking looks like um nothing too deep uh we have people that work on saturdays so they get a weekend differential and right now because we have enough full-time people we have coverage from Monday through Friday, and then we have coverage Tuesday through Saturday. And we have some wiggle room if somebody's on vacation, sick, mm -hmm. whatever. So things are, things are moving right along. Parking actually went up because of the employees, but those were some vacancies that finally got filled. Um, if you may, I, I, listen, the, um, for the processing, um, is debit an option because it's usually cheaper for processing? It does, they don't yes. charge as much as they do for credit. So right, debit is a flat rate. Um, in my side, it's three ninety five. In people's, I believe it's three and a quarter. Different so, banks. So the means to pay with a debit card as opposed to a bank check would probably be just as easy. That would be wonderful, really. Or our own online system for a quarter, or right. the fee if you want to use a credit card. Yeah. So okay, thank you, uh, Council of the Barge. Melissa, what type of training do um, your parking staff have to go through? The enforcement people on the street? <coughs> yeah. Um, basically, they were trained from some veteran enforcement people, and then they retired, and so now we keep passing it along. Um, we have a new parking clerk because our other one retired in January, and she's way qualified. She um, was a former police officer and was working in Smith College parking for quite a few years. So she's extremely qualified and very good with the public. Um, we have one of the enforcement officers who's been on the job about three years. He became the parking hearing officer. So he's inside now and he's thankful every day. And um, even when it's nice out, he says, I'm still happy. I said, okay. And he's um, seasoned enough that he took them out. Um, the parking clerk took them out to show them the lay of the land. Um, they had about two weeks on the job training with somebody with them and then they would go out with somebody on the street that's seasoned and they'd go on the other side of the street so that if they had a problem and of course they've got radios so they're in contact so they're doing really well they're all on their own now and they're doing good it says the parking clerk's office is using a new computer program can you tell us what that's all okay that's that's the same computer program complus that's it okay. that's it but they've been able to expand some of the things that were offered now they're starting to use them um, we now we now take the passes over here and you can get them for up to three months at a time and that's um, $45 a pass I believe and um, a month and so that's now in the system so they can do that and everything spits out so you have all your records that you could possibly need which is nice and then we um, when we took over some of the other parking fees coming in when the garage dissipated um, talking with Tom Scanlon's group we had to find out with Susan's help we had to find out where to put these in the general ledger so we could see them and understand who's making and who's not and where it goes and and that was you know an auditing standpoint so we have that now so that's my assistant takes care of most of the parking revenue and she enters it once a week into the correct category so that Susan always knows where everything is. Melissa, I want to thank you and thank all your employees. I've never heard you ever complain about being the director there. I don't ever hear anything from your staff. It seems like I know and you have every time I see you being placed in your office you do it and you all work very well and I think that's so valuable because so many people see that and they know how to see your offices we get a lot of customers that come in and, and they, we, you know we know them we get to know them you know besides being local people we know them anyway and it's a lot of fun at times we have a lot of good time yeah my staff is wonderful uh, yeah. they make me look real good thank you <laughs> thank you all um, other questions? Um, Lisa, uh, 
uh, there's been discussion, and I realize there's a significant cost associated with with transferring the meter heads over to accept cards and for transactions. Is there a cost benefit analysis that's being explored now? Um, I believe that's Dave Pomerantz, so you okay, may so want to ask him about that. But it's it's a great idea, okay. and um, I know Amherst has started doing it. I haven't heard anything negative from them. Um, my parking clerk also went to school last year for different types of things to do in garages and whatever. So she's very well versed on the idea of having a number spot and then you have a number. I, I don't know exactly how it works, but it seems to work well. Well, Amherst, so I, 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 I took me about an hour to figure it out, but I did figure it out. But it's, uh, <laughs> it's supposed <laughs> to be better. <laughs> it took me an hour and one parking ticket, but it, right. I did figure it out. And maybe we can do a little better in education than Amherst. Right. Right. Actually, Mr. as Mr. Pomerantz can expand on that, but we're doing a con we're working with a consultant to help us assess these technologies and what the next wave of technology right. will be for Northampton. So that process has begun. So. Thank you. As our, as our garage technology is really getting old. I, I knew there were discussions, but it was a, that's good. Right. Any other questions or comments for uh, the collector? Nope. Alyssa, thank you again. Thank I appreciate you. you coming in, and uh, and good luck. Uh, there's heavy <laughs> thunderstorm warning that just came alert that just came through, bearing down on Northampton. Just to give you all a heads up. Just so. <laughs> and, and since we got Vanessa coming up next, she's going to tell us all to unplug our computers for the for surge protection. Softball size hail. That's what. That's. Is that what they're yeah. saying? Don't yeah. start on that. Saw it play on TV. Uh, don't like start. Car. I see it now. Did you see it? About my dog. Wiped out. Wiped out. Tens of no. thousands of cars in car lots. Where? Softball size hail in Oklahoma. Is it, Tens of thousands of cars. People. He's got nobody's lap to get in. <laughs> kill you. Yeah, Unbelievable. It's a big dog. Yeah, yeah this one. Scary. Right now it's. It, do you know what it would do to little children? Oh, right. It's in uh, Franklin County right now. Headed this way. Yeah, it was, uh, intense winds it's blow down potential tornado lightning and hail. Where? Thunder lightning. Thunder lightning. Oh yeah, that's, that's a good. <laughs> yeah. I'm going. Yeah. You mean it's coming south it's from the north? It's coming, it's moving. Is that coming back? I have no idea. I'm going to get in his car. I'm going to get in his car. It's all for days. I don't care about that. It doesn't look good out there. The carnage in Oklahoma from that softball size hill. And it's not showed video on CNN today. All right. Ours. You are still, we'll still, um, let's, let's proceed and we can deal with the, uh, the yeah, apocalypse in a little bit. Uh, Vanessa's here from MIS, uh, page 40 in your budget. And it was, it was, uh, Between 8 and 8.30. What's that? Between 8 and 8.30. 8 and 8.30. Okay. Talk fast. Let's All right, go. So, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Vanessa. <laughs> uh, Vanessa, I'm unplugging my laptop right now. So. Thank you. Um, Between 8 and 8.30. Good evening to everybody. Uh, I just want to go. I know people have the opportunity to just go into question or right. talk a little bit. I just want to go over some of the highlights because I'm listening to other people that were before me and I say, oh, we're helping that. We're helping that. So one of the high, some of the highlights in this past year have been that we implemented Google App. We moved to the cloud with our Gmail, I'm sorry, with our email platform. Um, we implemented some consolidation of server, further consolidation, consolidation, which allow if a server fails, another one takes over automatically. So there's no apparent disruption for the user. This is in critical servers, not on all of them at this point. Um, we were at DPW on and off. We are at DPW on and off. Uh, so we're very flexible when people need us, then we're there. <laughs> Um, we su provided the support for the network copier, and I'm going over this because you know what we do, but we're the IT department, our department in management information system, but we're the IT department for the city of Northampton. Um, one of the things that we did that it's, we set up uh, a server at the senior center for them to store their file and then set up remote backups. The backups are now centralized into MIA from recreation from some of the DPW servers, not all of them, some of the DPW servers and the recreation department. Um, 
we were asked by the calling center consultant to develop a database for the fire department for tracking car seat installation. We did that like was in a blink of an eye and we hadn't done that. Two of us were um, working on that. We hadn't done that like in probably 10 years. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if people are aware development and networking and all this stuff are different like uh, specialties. So we were able to do that uh, and when we were going to implement it, we found out, oh, but we want this, 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 further things. So that was done in a, you see rapid development methodology. They're using it right now. And we had a vacant position for seven months. The system analyst position, which is the network and PC uh, technician was vacant for seven months. That's probably a constant struggle to keep uh, steady um, staffing levels. Right now, I have a really good group of people again. We're stable. We'll see. Uh, one of the things we're looking is to, we're helping the, or supporting the parking clerk's office effort with credit card implementation, uh, the technical aspects. Uh, we are also pursuing bring, uh, helping recreation for their online rec uh, online recreation registration. And sometimes we get involved and the issues are not really technical. There are some hurdles that are not technical that we have to deal with beforehand. So we get involved early in the process. And those are the projects that probably are most successful when people involve us since the beginning. Um, for FY14, one of the things we're doing is that we have been in talk with other communities and trying to identify collaboration opportunities. So we are now, we have a regional IT director group from Western Mass, from Berkshire, Hamden, and Hampshire. We've been meeting probably every other month. Uh, we are working on plans. If they finally come to be reality, there will be opportunity for us to uh, Hosts in the, for example, wholesome application maybe in Springfield or Westfield and things like that. So we're working on that. Um, the city clerk's office is very interested in expanding the use of credit card. That's not really a technology issue. Most of the issues procurement, but as, as I said, we get involved in, in them. So a lot of our job is not technical, it's like facilitating uh, adoption of or changing in processes that might have some technical component, but not necessarily are a technology challenge. Um, in terms of the FY14 budget, if we were asked to present a level budget, so we have to reduce or cut some, some line items. So our budget had like little itty bitty increase, which I don't think it reaches 1% that I remember. Um, most of our budget goes into licensing. There are two budget items in the OM. There are the bigger one, like licenses and techno technology services. And it's really already contracts that we have, either for software support, uh, for paying like the maintenance of the financial system or the permitting system, etc. Another thing we'll be doing when we started is to look at possible replacement for our existing permit system. Um, that will probably take a while because we have different people, different department involved and, involved and there are different philosophies on what they want. Uh, we're trying to keep a integrated system, but some people want to go in their own direction. <laughs> that's, for the, that's for the permit system, you said? Permit and licensing, yes. Uh -huh. We use GOTMS and some departments find that the modules for their specific needs are not suitable. They have used other uh, applications that are specific for their needs in other places. So that's the problem with an integrated system that you have to compromise sometimes in, this might work well for one department, but it doesn't work well for another one. So right now, the level of dissatisfaction on the existing system is probably at the lowest ever. I'm sorry, at the lowest, the level of satisfaction. So we are looking into, we have a group looking into possible replacement. There's no procurement at this point. We're just trying to identify, trying for them to decide what is that they don't like, 
what do they want to see? And then we'll see if we go into a procurement process, if that's feasible. A lot of our efforts don't go anywhere. To take. <laughs> and that's sometimes frustrating because we are asked to look at things, we look at things and then nothing happens because either it's not financially feasible or because for whatever reason. Um, so when we come to present results, it's like, what are you presenting? You know, you spend the whole year doing these things and there are like three things that you accomplished, but you were doing like 20. <laughs> so, any questions? Uh, Councilor Barnes. Um, I noticed, um, Vanessa, that your professional te technical fee increased. In 2013, it was 52,000, something like $400, and now it's what? In 2014 budget, 201,395. Is that correct? Professional technical, it says 201,395. And in 2013, counselor, I think that's right, 52,400. Okay, let me I'm trying to open my work spreadsheet to I have the details. Okay, that's professional and technical services. A lot of that is uh, for the cloud solution for the financial system. Uh, we have, um, when we have moved the financial system to the cloud, there has been an increase in the cost, and that's due because they have to cover the cost of replacement server. We don't cover it anymore. Uh, we used to cover the license fee. It was about $88,000 a year, and it will increase every year about three, five percent. So when we enter into a three-year contract, it has basically make that amount stable for three years. So it, say it will be the same amount for three years. So we don't have to buy servers anymore to replace that. We don't have to pay that increase in licenses every year. Um, we have also there an estimate of, we have to estimate how much the permit system will be, well, how much will the fees will be that we have to pay. The permit system, the contract is, we pay per uh, fees collected. So if the building inspector collects $100,000, we, we, it doesn't matter what, we pay 3.5% of what they collect. So we estimate every year. And that was a problem, estimation. And finally, in some, year, uh, some years ago, we decided, okay, we're gonna put a cap to it. And so this amount might be lower that we're budgeting for it. We're budgeting about $27,000. And that amount really the maximum, the top cap. Once everything is done at the end of the year, the fiscal year, if the fee collected, what well, we have to pay the 3.5% might not reach that. It might reach 24, 25,000. But we have to budget for the worst case scenario, which is the contract. Okay, so on your telephone, that increased also. In 2013, it was $10,356, and now you're up to $50,000, correct? Uh, I don't have the Y13 amounts. 10356 and 213 and it's 50,000 now. I don't have the telephone account, but it should have been about 60,000, I think, last year. It's 10,000. It says 10,000 in the book, 10,356 in our 2013 budget. Okay, I will have to look at that. I'm sorry, I have to get back to you on that one because we need a sidebar on this one. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah sorry. <laughs> I should have brought the 2013 uh, worksheet. So I think I looked at it earlier. I think the guess. lines are actually not quite lining up. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> it's actually going down. So the telephone line last year was 52.4. Oh, okay. It's the Thank technology you. communication line that mm -hmm. was 10. Okay. Right. That made more sense. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's why I was surprised because our phone calls have been going down. On. We, and another thing is this is, these are the calls that we estimate that will be, uh, that we pay for the phone line. Uh, some of this is uh, charged back to departments. So the city portion is not necessarily all that. Again, it depends. Uh, every month we calculate this portion goes to the school, this portion goes to the library. Um, 
I will get back to you on that one. Actually, after this meeting, I'll go and check my spreadsheet, but I don't have that document. It's Q4 until technology communications. It's just, it's, it's, it's an optical illusion. Uh, <laughs> Something. <concert from Indiana. laughs> as long as we get it right. I know. I know it didn't Let's put it this way. When we started with the new phone system, I, I went and checked because I was expecting questions from you on that. I didn't want to get caught off guard. Uh, so we, we started about $85,000, and right now we're down to forty-five. That's for Freeman Daniels. So can you, can you review the um, benefits and costs for uh, switching to a uh, Google uh, Apps and uh, and um, and the archive system. Sure. Uh, as everybody's aware, we had a meltdown with the, our existing in-house hosted Microsoft Exchange. Um, so by migrating to the cloud, we are avoiding to replace server and avoiding the headaches of um, human error. That was actually that, that that was human error. That's why we were without staff for seven months, full staff. Um, so we avoid those email. Is really it used to be like a generic tool that people didn't care about, but now it's like really necessary for business communication. Um, so a lot of the costs are intangible. In terms of if you want to look at cents, how much we're saving, we're probably really spending more, slightly more. And the reason is because we used to have X amount of users. We used to have about 150 users for, for email in our system. And now everybody has email. So the last group is like the fire department and DPW came on board also. Which they used to have their own email system. Now we have 300. We'll have 351 uh, users. So that's why the costs have gone up because we have more, more licenses. So I think that the the, in terms of the benefits of business communication and uh, continuity of operation, I think that that awaits a lot. You know the headaches of or, or the less expensive system here. One of the possibilities in the future, if things pan out, we might be able to go and use email from Springfield or some, you know, if they provide that service. Again, those, all those things are right now uh, in a discussion phase. They might not pan out, but if they do, we might have opportunities to save in certain areas. Right, thank you. Uh, any other questions for Vanessa? One more. I know that us counselors approved some money for the mayor for a consultant. Mayor, maybe you can talk about that. Has that been taken care of? Uh, so we, um, I did form a technology um, and web uh, advisory committee. Um, actually, uh, I ended up, we were talking about it um, in the context of when you reprogrammed the um, those dollars that we would have spent on servers, we reprogram that for this look at our technology system. Um, I ended up uh, actually um, heeding Councilor Owen Freeman Daniels' advice, which was to uh, put that committee together first and let them help me work on that whole issue of the consultant. So we've been looking at the, um, we've actually, so we have a committee, it's uh, made up of citizens who volunteered, uh, Vanessa's on it. We also have the technology um, director for the schools is on it. And we have a couple of department heads, um, actually um, Emery Mogio, who, who relies a lot on the website for her rec department, and then Wayne Fiden, who obviously is a power user of the website. So, and we're actually now, um, so we're, we're going through that process, looking at different consultants who are out there. We're also looking at web, uh, at websites as well, because uh, the committee kind of felt that that's a very specialized thing and wanted to break that off. So that committee's been meeting, and we've been moving forward. So we haven't uh, we haven't expended those funds yet, uh, but we're going through a deliberative process to to arrive at that. So, yep. That's it. Uh, thank you very much, Vanessa. Go go uh, check your surge protection. Yes. Thank you for all your hard work. <laughs> Get it figured out.
Okay, thank you. Uh, last but not least, coming in from yes. the looming storm, Building Commissioner Louie is here. Good. Right. Come on, step on up to the, uh, the podium. Uh, it's page 63 on your budget. Page 63. Um, We're getting this late with this. So what, what I've been doing is giving um, uh, department heads the option of making a little presentation, or you can just open up the questions, whatever your preference is. And he has some handouts there, comfortable the barge. There's a few more. Are, are those the same thing? Just different versions of the same. Different thing. versions, just lots of paper for us. Thank you so much. Here, you <laughs> we got a new uh, copy of the printer. Congratulations. This is great. And this will be part of the discussion, I'm sure. <laughs> Dave, comrade. Dave. Okay. Yeah, we'll talk about that. We'll take it away. Okay, so uh, good evening. We've had a we've had a really busy year so far. Um, we had a, a bit of a slowdown in <clears throat> in FY12, but it's come back um, with a vengeance, and uh, we're well on. We're ahead of right now, as of the end of May, we're ahead of where we were um, in the best year we've had so far. We've kept records, and we're really likely to um, take in another fifty thousand or so before the end of the year. And I see a lot of projects coming for next year, too. I, mean, I think building has definitely picked up. Um, the downside is that um, we've got a level-funded budget, and we're going to be uh, working awfully hard to keep up. I mean, we don't take in monies um, without having to provide services, and I think it's going to be difficult. I know we... Uh, um, I'm going to work really hard to keep within the budget that we've presented for this year, but there's a possibility that that we'll, because of the number of projects that have come in in the last like three or four months, that we may well run over a little next year. And I hate to say it, but um, I mean we're not. I don't think we'll be asking for if we are asking for more money. I don't think it will. We'll be able to demonstrate the revenues that we've. Which, which translate into the number of jobs, which then, which number of projects that are underway, which then translate into the number of inspections that we need to do. Are all your positions filled now? They, they are all filled. We've, um, we have, um, we have in the past had an additional uh, intermint electrical inspector, but we've seen we seem it seems that we have a regular inspector and an additional part time inspector, and I think we're going to get by with that. Yeah, so, Brenda's position has been filled. Correct? Yes, uh, we got a, a man named Kyle Scott who's hit the ground running. He's, uh, I'm I'm really heartened to see how quickly he's picking up. So, with the expanded building. Large systems, retrofitting, uh, uh, renovations, um, all, all of the above. The, whole, the, whole, the spectrum? Uh, whole spectrum. Smith College is is in the process of a twenty-six million dollar renovation of a dorm. I don't, you know, I don't. It, I think they could have built another one for less money, but they're committed to their campus. Um, but it's a uh, it's a huge job. Um, and um, we were looking at the preliminary plans for the renovations at Clark School, um, and we're in this sort of the beginnings of a negotiating for uh, um, about 65,000 square feet of, uh, how are they describing them? I think luxury condos. And uh, I think they're luxury apartments. Apartments? No. Oh. I think they're rentals. Oh, they're going to hold them? And... Uh, you know, there's uh, the Zoe Life Center, which is, I think, uh, 70,000 square feet of uh, assisted living facility next to Linda Manor. The permit's on the table. Um, 
the, uh, the you know, and then the stuff we've already taken in the car dealerships and the. Um, You know, so, so a, a lot, you know, an awful lot of stuff. I looked at some, uh, some sort of the, the very preliminary presentation on um, plans for the Clarion, which um, looked pretty exciting. I don't know how quickly they're going to go along, but it got a positive reception from the um, from the people that sat at the tech review meeting. I don't this is see. A, a, a I don't see. Retro. Uh, this is the cl the existing Clarion. This is not the hotel that's being built. No, this is that's that's another piece. No, the Clarion is proposing, you know, a, a, a new hotel building and a restaurant and a, another office building, and I think it's the same people that are doing the other two office buildings. So, and they're filling up. You know, the spaces are they're not building. You know, I think hoping that people will show up. They're you know they're doing the build outs as they get leases and. They're building them out quickly. So no derelict structures. Uh, no. Councilor Freeman Day. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Hasbrook. Uh, what is the, I mean, when you say that you might have to have some overrun this year, that would be for overtime or, or uh, that, I, is that what it probably I be? It would be additional inspections and additional inspectors. And we have uh, provisions in the budget for We've we've slotted for uh, we call them intermittent plumbing and electrical inspectors, and they're they're just uh, backups for our full time person. And we can we would potentially ex extend the hours of those people. We don't have a backup uh, building inspector uh, uh, in place, but we may well look for uh, an inspector from another community that that could give us some part time work. So the the two uh, the we wouldn't I I would I, I would um, it, it, we won't look at overtime I mean overtime is a you know um, something that we can I think avoid. So um, let me it's fine I, I'm just saying you have two intermittent plumbing inspectors here. We have we have people signed up for two intermittent plumbing inspectors, but you, I think you can see that the the amount we've slotted budgeted for them is, in, is just barely enough to cover. The uh, plum our regular plumbing inspectors vacation and sick time. Okay, so. and then um, what uh, what what takes up the? Um, I mean, how how much is enforcement part of the your your um, staff time? Um, it's difficult for me to come up with a specific number, partly because. Um, I have been handling the, a lot of the enforcement um, without tracking it very effectively, um, but um, the new inspector is a fully half of his jo job commitment is to is to inf enforcement, and he seems to be um, very skilled at it. He um, he's been involved in um, local politics in Montague, and I think he as uh, as a member of the planning board. So I think he really does understand how zoning violations come to be and and how uh, how you go about working through them we've been using him he's that's a lot of what he's been doing uh, Councilor Murphy mm -hmm. I mean the good thing about your department is the busier you are the more fees you're generating for the most part so if you've got to have additional help chances are there's corresponding fees that come in to help offset that and then the nice other nice thing about this is that you're inspecting new growth which is added revenue to the city totally so I mean if you're busy it's a good sign for our bottom line both in the fees collected to cover your work and also in potential future property tax revenue from these new buildings that are being created so if there's any place we want to see busy it's your office because uh, particularly with commercial structures because that's about the best found money a municipality can find uh, particularly uh, hotels they're like the gift that keeps on giving so uh, it, it's, it, I know it's a little uh, stressful for you to have to cover all the inspections but it's good for us both in the fees and, and in the and in the ta new growth and the potential tax revenue how uh, just 
one more quick question. How close do you feel people are currently in your permits? You know, what they estimate, what they're building, what the fee, you know, the fee is just based on the permit and people don't usually overestimate what they think it's gonna to cost to build their structure when they're getting their permit. How, how closely is that policed? We, well, we certainly monitor it and uh, we pay less attention to the less expensive permits. Um, about um, more than half of our permits are for projects that are less than ten thousand dollars of estimated cost, and so, so we there's we are um, we've seen some pretty outrageous uh, proposals. I'm, I remember uh, f several years ago, uh, Tony Patillo was presented with a million uh, with a hundred thousand dollar project that was estimated at like twenty five thousand dollars and I haven't come to anything quite that um, uh, quite with quite that much disparity but we did uh, recently on a fairly significant project um, re uh, make the um, uh, the uh, contractor um, give us more information and we in a, we in a, I think in that situation we um, push the fee up by about five thousand um, dollars but people people consistently especially for work that renovation work where where the the cost of the permit is based on the estimated cost of the job people underestimated and uh, hopefully it happens pretty evenly across the board and well, I feel like, uh, you know uh, uh, redoing a kitchen or you know those sort of things they're hard to estimate because you never know the quality of the materials and they could end up, you know, giving you a basic estimate and then, then jacking the quality of all the materials. So they're doing the same work, but the cabinets cost twice as much and the flooring costs twice as much. And those are hard to catch. Mm -hmm. But I know you share info with the assessors. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody pulls a permit, they know about it, they're planning on it. Do they ever, is there any coordination between you where they, you know, they're, they're looking at the land value and the ultimate property value to give you a heads up that, you know, hey, this seems like a bargain compared on what the structure is theoretically going to be worth and obviously it's good for somebody if they they can build something for a lot less than it's ultimately worth but it's also probably a heads up that maybe they're they're cheating on their, their estimate for construction a little bit the our relationship with the assessors potentially goes a bit the other way in the sense that they're often feeding us back feeding back to us information on projects that they've seen that don't seem to show up in the permit files um, and so we've been you know we've had a lot of discussions with with uh, property owners who are have their uh, houses on the market and there's we have been some rent some se been. serious renovations that didn't show up um, we do have a there's we have a uh, sort of a check back on um, estimated cost of construction because there are there's some numbers about how much it ought to cost per square foot to do you know a minor renovation a major renovation um, and and the estimated cost of new construction also and so we we do check back with that periodically um, and I'm, I'm assuming some of your inspectors have been in the trades long enough that they know a, a hundred thousand dollar kitchen from a thirty thousand dollar kitchen if they walk in the door they can go and you know we we also do put that information the estimated cost of construction and the uh in the permit fee on the permit card so i mean it's hanging in the if the homeowner w were to go look at it they'd uh you know they'd have to be in collusion with the contractor um not that that would never happen but <laughs> Well, they're the ones that pay for the permit, right? So. You looked right at me when you said that. No. <laughs> <laughs> no I was just checking the uh, side of the room. Uh, the mayor wanted to say something, and then uh, Councilor Carney, and then Councilor Freeman Daniels. I just wanted to, and I, I want to thank um, uh, the building commissioner for all the work that he's doing. And I, I just want to make sure that we keep in context that, you know, this department, and you've had several come before you, you know, we're basically level funding their budgets. Mm -hmm. Um, in the context of trying to close the gap that we, we're all talking about. And so we're basically, we know that this is not what he needs to provide the same level of services. That's not, so it's not, we're not penalizing him. This is, a, this is in the context of what we're having to do across all of our departments. So I just wanted to put that in, in but I, I think that's a reasonable point to make. Um, because his, we are, we are describing because, a budget that yeah. does not consider an override if the override is implemented. 
and it doesn't, and it also doesn't account for just the cost of, of labor increases and everything else. We've right. ha we've had to have him cut on his uh, maintenance budget and cut and find other ways to cut to get to level. So uh, I just want to put that in context. That's that it's, that's, that's an appropriate. And you line. heard the same thing from MIS, and you heard the same thing from all uh, yeah, these departments. That true through. They're small departments, so it may not seem significant, the 6,000, the 8,000, the 10,000, but when you add that up across all the city budgets, it's significant. So. Councilor Carney and then Councilor Freeman Daniels. And <clears throat> just along the same lines that Councilor Murphy brought up, um, in terms of having access to information about the building. You referenced a number of high-priced ones. It's the Cutter Siskin right at Smith? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, and the other big ones, maybe the Clarion and others. Especially with the Smith, do you, do you have access to the bid documents? Are there things there that they might share? Is it strictly what's written down on the permit application? I feel like the, on the bigger jobs, we we have absolute access to the to the real numbers. And when you, when you know when a job is, you know, at the million dollars or so, we're going to have a really good idea that 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 the estimated cost is is uh, is relates to the to the contracts that are in place. And sometimes we'll see something develop as the job goes along, and we'll go back and ask um, for. Um, an amendment to the permit and so that we can get capture the you know the, the actual work that's going on but also you know and and ask for more money if the if the work is more expensive right. so um, I know you mentioned that the building permit fee is directly proportional to the cost of the job now is that the same for the mechanical um, uh, for the plumbing and the HVAC each each the, the building permit fee captures the total cost of construction. It includes the cost of electrical plumbing. The plumbing and uh, the plumbing permits are uh, fee schedule is, is on uh, appliances, fixtures. Each fixture costs X amount of dollars. The electrical permit fees are based on either flat fees for the smaller jobs or um, per square foot for the larger jobs. Um, okay. Sheet metal fees. Um, are um, minimal. Um, a, a project that only had a bunch of sheet metal work involved in it would would be done at the six dollars per thousand of estimated cost. But if if there's a commercial sheet metal permit that's taken out in conjunction with a um, with a building permit, we charge a nominal fee because those inspections. Are being done as a part of the building inspections, um, and the, actually the, the the sheet metal permit process is is uh, pretty recent. But the sheet metal mm -hmm. inspections have been going on, you know, as a part of the building inspections for, for a, a number of years. It's not like we haven't inspected the ductwork. Well, it shouldn't go also without being said that um, those jobs that you mentioned will require a lot of labor. Um, to go in, I mean, despite the, the amount of money that's coming in, and so with the staffing levels that you have, it really will keep people pretty busy to, to meet the inspection demands for all of those. You know, there are quite, quite a number of, of, of uh, jobs that are, their costs that are estimated at less than $10,000 where we'll do four inspections, you know, right. a foundation inspection, a framing inspection, insulation inspection, and a final inspection. Even though it's you know a, an addition no bigger than the podium, you have to still go the four times. Right. So. Um, Mr. Freeman Daniels, would you defer to Councilor uh, Casey since he has not asked? Yet. I just wanted to attest to the collaboration between the assessor's office and the building inspector's office. Because I never even get to, I barely get to turn a rock or drive a nail, and I look over my shoulder and here comes Joan Serafin and Joe Cross. <laughs> it's immediate. I no, we really do. Is. We do have the. We do have the uh, instant feedback, um, where we provide them with all our um, permit documents. Um, you know, right away. I think that's pretty well oiled. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. she likes her new growth. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound right. Really too. <laughs> There's no grass growing under her feet. That's for sure. You know, this 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 year year to date so far so at the end of may we've had about there's been about 55 or 56 million dollars of new construction in northampton and last year 
the total was about 35 million of new construction. So, you know, we're seeing some, you know, some That's significant calendar year. That's calendar year. Uh, fiscal, fiscal year. Fiscal year. Right. So fiscal year tw uh, 12, the total ended up being about 35,000 and, and year to date. So we have another month to go. And I suspect I'm going to see some um, some more significant permits by the end of the year. Car. It's wonderful. It is, it is absolutely wonderful. Used. It's, uh, yeah. it's, yours is we got a new. We did get a new one. Nice shiny black Subaru. So that is that. What's going on with that? Uh, decrease of the new vehicle on, on your operations. So you have a tw almost three thousand dollar decrease. Well, we're hoping that we aren't. We we were spending a lot of money keeping the old uh, um, vehicles alive, and you know I hope to do nothing but put very little bit of gas into this new vehicle for several years. And then the other was the tele your telephone. You cut that budget dramatically. Are you just going to not take phone calls anymore or what? No, I think that that's been a, uh, that, that's pulled over a line item that I think has been um, back when people actually got paid for having a cell phone. I see. Uh, we, get, we get a stipend now, and it's... Uh, much smaller than it was before. Councilor Murphy, you had a question? Oh, just, um, I think Mr. Hasbrook told Capital Improvements when it came to getting his new car that the old car, they'd only drive somewhere that they wanted to walk back from. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so the no, I, new car is well overdue. We walked back from um, a job just the other day. We still, we're still using it. And, uh, you know, we have to make it, you know, have to make a judgment. It, I think it's just going through a bad patch because it sees the new one, but, but uh, <laughs> it's been reliable up, up until fairly recently, and I'm hoping that. And we did we did set aside some money from our current year's budget to to be able to you know put a uh, a little put a piece you know put a chunk of work at it, and it's over at um, the garage right now getting appraised as to how much it would cost you know what needs to get done and we can look at that uh, we are going to come in under budget this year um, we um, are not going to we're going to i think be able to give back some amount of money to the city on our current year's budget but part of that is because we were sh down on st we were short staffed and we were short staffed early in the year when the, we weren't as busy. Uh, but we'll be very busy from here on out. The uh, brunt of this storm is in your other your other area of uh, service, Williamsburg, right now. So, if we adjourn soon, we can all get home in time to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, Louis. Um, Motion to adjourn. Thank you. There's second. A, there's a second. All those in favor of adjourn. Thank you all very much.